Today we complete our FY25 budget and posture hearings with the Department of the Navy. I want to thank the ranking member and all members for their cooperation, hard work, and dedication as we work through 26 hearings in 13 legislative days. These hearings have helped provide the information we need to mark up the FY25 NDAA uh, later this month. I also want to thank our witnesses uh, for being here for their service to our nation. Admiral, uh, this is the first time uh, you're appearing before us. Congratulations on your confirmation as the first female CNO, and thank you uh, for being here. General, it's the first time for you as well, and uh, we are all thankful for your speedy recovery and uh, are pleased to have you back leading our Marines. And Secretary Del Toro, it's always good to see you back uh, with the committee. The President's requesting a 1% increase for the Department of the Navy. Uh, Factoring in inflation, we all know that's a 2% cut. Just as with the other services, a budget that fails to provide real growth means the Navy had to make painful trade-offs and absorb real risk in their current and future readiness. We're seeing that very acutely in the request for shipbuilding. The President's seeking to build a paltry six Battle four ship, six Battle Force ships in FY25. At the same time, he wants to retire 19. Ten of those ships have several, several years of service life remaining. These retirements represent a huge loss of capability, and they leave us with a fleet of 287 ships in FY25. That's under the Navy's plan. The fleet will further drop uh, down to 280 in FY27. Forget about the 500-ship Navy uh, that many say we need to counter uh, China. At no point over the next 20 years does the size of the fleet even reach the 381 ships needed to support the national defense strategy. The budget also cuts the buy for the Virginia-class submarine below the two, two per year needed to fulfill our AUKUS commitment. I don't see how cutting the size of our fleet and shorting AUKUS, uh, our AUKUS commitment will deter China. I also fail to see how it will provide the stability needed to revitalize our industrial base. Uh, I am also concerned about the recent findings of the Navy's 45-day shipbuilding review. It is entirely unacceptable that nearly every single major shipbuilding program is experiencing significant schedule delays. We expect the Navy to provide us with a detailed plan to address these delays as soon as possible. One possible solution would be for the Navy to stop piling on new requirements and changing ship designs in the middle of procurements. As we've seen with the frigate program, that only leads to ballooning costs and late deliveries. Cutting the buys for new ships, delaying deliveries, and decommissioning ships before the end of their service lives will place significant additional stress on readiness of the fleet. That's a big problem for two reasons. First, the fleet is already suffering readiness issues. Maintenance availabilities are taking much longer than planned, inhibiting our ability to project power. The Marines have experienced uh, that firsthand when maintenance issues with the USS Boxer delayed the return of the Bataan Amphibious Ready Group earlier this year. And last year, maintenance issues meant there wasn't an amphibious ready group available to evacuate Americans from Sudan. The second problem is the Navy is currently carrying out operations at a much higher than planned tempo. The Navy is quickly using up missiles, burning through fuel, and extending deployments as it defends the Red Sea and Israel uh, from Iran's terrorist proxies. I don't see the security environment improving in the Middle East anytime soon. I'd like to hear from our witnesses how they expect to continue to carry out these operations with a smaller budget. Finally, I'd like to hear from the Commandant on the progress he's making with force design. Preparing our Marines to be successful in a potential conflict with China is critically important. Force design will do just that. And with that, I yield to my friend, the Ranking Member, for any opening statement he may have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to echo your, your comments and welcoming our witnesses, um, and General Smith in particular. It is, is great to see you um, healthy uh, and doing well. Great to have you all here. I think the Chairman outlined very well the challenges that we face. I mean, certainly the budget's at the top of the list. Now, the one piece of it I always like to add is, what are we doing with the money that we have 
um, where are we spending money that maybe we shouldn't be spending? I know there's always a desire to look at something and say, gosh, wouldn't it be better if we had more money? I think that applies to just about everybody in every aspect of, of life, you know, business or government. But we do have a fair amount. Where are we spending money that we shouldn't be spending money? And how can we get more out of what we're spending? Because, you know, we are... I, $33 trillion in debt. <clears throat> the deficit is pretty substantial, over a trillion. I don't see a rain of more money coming anytime soon, so we're going to have to get more creative about how we how we spend, the, spend that money. Um, I look, like to use the Winston Churchill quote about how, gentlemen, we're out of money, now we have to think. Um, I know that's a bit of an overstatement, but it, it, I, I have found it to be more fruitful than, than you might think at first, at first glance. Uh, and then second, the shipbuilding challenges, without question. Um, you know, Chairman outlined those. I know a huge part of it is workforce. Um, you know, and I, I think there's a major challenge we have in this country. In many instances, we just don't have the workers with the skills necessary to meet those challenges. And we need to get very creative about how we recruit and get more people into the shipbuilding industry. You know, this is not, not a great place to bring up an immigration debate. Um, you know, but, you know, immigration is potentially one place where we could find some of those workers. And as we are all painfully aware, there are a lot of people who want to come here. Uh, seems to me that we ought to be able to match up those two problems a little bit better uh, than we are. Um, and then on the requirements piece, I just really want to footstop what um, the chairman said. Um, and I don't know the specific ins and outs about how requirements may or may not have shifted. But I'm very confident that we have too many requirements. I was um, out at a shipyard just next to my district um, where they were doing repairs on an LCS. And some of the people explained to me, and I, I could be getting this slightly wrong, but there was something like 1,200 pages of requirements for how to paint the bot, the, the, the subsea part of the ship. Um, and the people working on it thought that was a little bit unnecessary. Um, I have sort of a standard joke about how, you know, I wish if I had the power, I could do like a Thanos thing where I could snap my fingers and make half of all the requirements go away and I don't really care which half, okay? <laughs> if we could just start to look at it that way. And, and requirements are also frequently used by various people lobbying from industry because they want the requirements to vector it down to where they get picked. Um, that doesn't help us. We need to build in more flexibility in how we do these things. And along those lines, the modernization challenge. I know General Smith, your, your predecessor, General Berger, really took on that challenge. What is you know, the, the current state of warfare and the future of it? And how do we shift to make sure we're accommodating that? We got to get better at that. Force protection is part of it. Uh, the chairman mentioned the, the pace and the tempo. The cliche of using a $2 million missile to shoot down a $50,000 drone. We have new innovative technologies that could get us to a cheaper result. We have got to speed those up so that we're spending less money um, and still getting the same result. Um, directed energy, personally, I think the microwave approach probably is going to work better than the laser approach. But let's make a choice and let's start figuring out how we can build this and get us to a, you know, a better, more cost-effective way to meet our needs. Same true for un, unmanned systems. Um, you know, what, what are the systems that are really going to help us meet our challenges in the most cost-effective way possible? And then lastly, you know, no posture hearing would be complete without talking about recruitment and retention. You know, our military is the greatest in the world because of the people who serve and the families that support them. Um, I know this committee has taken on the task with our quality of life uh, task force to say what can we do to really improve the quality of life for service members and their families. That's part of the equation. But would love to hear from all of you about how recruitment and retention is going and what we can do to help it be more successful. Um, with that, I thank the chairman, thank the committee for going through another, another posture se season. Um, and I look forward to the testimony. I yield back. I uh, thank the ranking member. Now I'd like to introduce our witnesses, the Honorable uh, Carlos Del Toro, Secretary of the Navy. Uh, Admiral Lisa Franchetti is the Chief of Naval Operations and General Eric Smith, Commandant of the Marine Corps. I'd like to welcome our witnesses, and we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Secretary. You're recognized. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished members of the committee, it's an honor to again appear before you this morning to discuss the posture of the Department of the Navy. First and foremost, I would like to thank General Smith and Admiral Frank Ketty for answering again the call of our nation time and time again. They, like all who devote their careers and in many cases indeed sacrifice their very lives, 
in defense of their fellow Americans represent everything that makes the United States a beacon of hope and freedom around the world. Together, our combined years of service to our country totals over a century. A century marked by multiple deployments, time away from home, sacrifices made by our families. And as we gather here this morning, tens of thousands of our sailors, Marines, civilians, and their families are either stationed or deployed all over the world, making the same sacrifices and enduring the same trials that myself, General Smith, and Admiral Franchetti have faced throughout our careers. In the Indo-Pacific, our Navy and Marine Corps are sailing and operating alongside our international allies and partners in support of a free and open maritime commons, one where nations are secure in their access to the seas and where their rights within their exclusive economic zones are respected and upheld by all nations, including the People's Republic of China, as they should. Across Europe, we, in cooperation with our NATO allies, are supporting our Ukrainian partners as they continue their fight to restore their territorial and national sovereignty as Russia's illegal full-scale invasion is now into its third year. I commend Congress for passing the national security supplementals last month, allowing us to continue providing support to our Ukrainian partners as they fight to restore peace in their homeland and defend democracy for all free nations. And in the Red Sea, Today, our sailors and Marines have countered hundreds of missiles and drones launched by the Houthis these past six months, targeting merchant shipping in the warships of both the United States and our international allies and partners. We are confronting an adversary supported by Iran that has no respect for the innocent lives of civilian merchant mariners and one that is actively targeting our ships, attempting to harm our sailors and Marines because we dare to defend the defenseless. And last month, the USS Kearney, the USS Arleigh Burke, both operating in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, intercepted several Iranian ballistic missiles heading towards Israel. For those who question why the American taxpayer should provide for and maintain a Navy and a Marine Corps, look at what is happening today in the Middle East, where we are defending the free flow of international commerce and actively defending our international allies and partners. Members of the committee, we appear before you today to ask for your continued support your partnership and your commitment to ensuring that the nearly one million sailors, Marines, and civilians of the department that we lead are ready on all fronts at all times when called upon. While the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023 required us to make extremely hard choices, the $257.6 billion in the President's budget request for fiscal year 25 for our department deputy balances maintaining and modernizing the fleet and force of today against planning for the future force, while also taking care of our people. This budget directly supports our department's three enduring priorities of strengthening our maritime dominance, building a culture of warfighting excellence, and enhancing our strategic partnerships around the globe. We are acquiring the most lethal, agile, and capable warships, submarines, aircraft, weapons, and systems our world has ever seen. We are also funding the research and development transformational technologies and fielding them more quickly to make our fleet more lethal and persistent within the current fit-up. We are investing billions of dollars in the industrial base that supports us, while encouraging them to invest more in resources themselves at the same time. And as responsible stewards of taxpayer funds, we will enforce accountability to ensure our sailors and Marines have the platforms and capabilities that they need on time and on budget. Above all else, we're taking care of our people, our personnel, their families, by focusing on improving housing, expanding childcare capacity, and increasing access to mental health resources, amongst other critical areas. We are clear-eyed about the challenges that our nation faces today in the maritime domain, both commercial and naval. And as a maritime nation, we must confront the challenges of today and prepare for the potential conflicts of tomorrow by investing in a strong Navy and Marine Corps. Again, it's an honor to appear before you this morning, and we look forward to discussing with you how best to deliver the Navy and Marine Corps that our nation requires. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Admiral, you're recognized. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished members of the committee, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on the posture of the United States Navy. On behalf of our sailors, Navy civilians, and their families deployed and stationed all around the world, thank you for your leadership and your continued support in providing and maintaining the Navy the nation needs. I'd also like to thank my teammate, General Smith, for his exceptional partnership and collaboration as we guide our services under the leadership of Secretary Del Toro. Flanked by two oceans, 
The United States is, and always has been, a maritime nation whose security and prosperity rely on access to the sea. And for over 248 years, the U.S. Navy has guaranteed that access, operating forward, defending our homeland, and keeping open the sea lines of communication that fuel our economy and underwrite our nation's security. The events of this past year and the actions taken by your Navy Marine Corps team in the Indo-Pacific, in the Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, and beyond, underscore the enduring importance of American naval power. With an average of 110 ships and 70,000 sailors and Marines deployed at sea on any given day, the Navy Marine Corps team is delivering power for peace, deterring potential adversaries, and standing ready to fight and win our nation's wars if deterrence fails. I could not be more proud of this team. No other Navy in the world can train, deploy, and sustain such a lethal, combat-credible force that operates from the seabed to space at the scope, scale, and tempo that we do. This year's budget request supports the national defense strategy and my priorities of warfighting, warfighters, and the foundation that supports them. It enables the Navy to continue to meet our congressionally mandated mission in both peace and war. It is strategy driven, maintaining our focus on the People's Republic of China as the pacing challenge and the acute threat of Russia and other persistent threats like the DPRK, Iran, and BEOs. Given the discretionary spending caps prescribed by the Fiscal Responsibility Act and a top line increase of 0.7%, the Navy had to make tough choices, favoring near-term readiness, investing in our industrial base, and prioritizing our people while assuming risk in future capabilities. Within this fiscally constrained environment, the budget request fully funds the Navy's top acquisition priority and the most survivable leg of strategic deterrence, the Columbia-class submarine. It provides funds for six Battle Force ships and incremental funding for two Ford-class aircraft carriers and FY25. And it continues our support to Marine Corps force design by maintaining 31 amphibious ships, procuring three LPDs, one LHA, and eight medium landing ships. In total, the budget request procures 57 ships and submarines across the FIDUP. This budget request prioritizes warfighting by funding operations, training, and readiness accounts. It invests in our foundation with funding for our installations, for our shipyard infrastructure optimization program, and for the broader defense industrial base, sending a strong signal to our industry partners on the need to increase our capacity to meet the growing demands of the present and the future. And it continues our strong commitment to our warfighters and our families through pay raises for our, sa our sailors and Navy civilians, investments in quality of service initiatives such as unaccompanied housing, education, childcare, and sailor resiliency. These initiatives, as well as others, enabled by your steadfast support, have helped us maintain historically high levels of retention which is imperative given the current recruiting environment. And while this environment remains challenging and our manning requirements have increased, we are about 2,500 recruits ahead of where we were last year at this time. And I remain optimistic that our marketing and data analytics investments will show additional progress throughout the year. I would also like to thank this committee for your commitment to our sailors' quality of life. The Navy is in receipt of the Quality of Life Panel Report and we look forward to working closely with Congress and the Office of the Secretary of Defense to ensure our sailors and their families have all they need as they support our nation's security and prosperity. As Chief of Naval Operations, I am committed to pulling every lever available to me to put more ready players on the field. Platforms that are ready with the right capabilities, weapons, and sustainment, and people who are ready with the right tools, skills, training, and mindset to defend our nation's security and prosperity wherever and whenever it is threatened. I thank the committee for your leadership and partnership in ensuring the world's premier warfighting force remains ready to preserve the peace, respond in crisis, and win decisively in war if called. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Admiral Franchetti. Uh, General Smith, you're recognized. Good morning, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to represent your Marines today. 
I'd like to start by sincerely thanking this committee for its enduring support and your advocacy for a timely, predictable, and sufficient budget that enables the Marine Corps to remain the first to fight. I'd like to express my deep gratitude for the partnership between my shipmate, Admiral Franchetti, and me as we lead our respective services under the leadership of Secretary Del Toro. Whether deterring, responding to crisis, or in conflict, it will be the Navy and our Marine Corps Expeditionary Forces who make first contact with partners seeking help or adversaries seeking a fight. Our partnership, collaboration, and integration is a decisive advantage. Recently, I published my updated guidance to the force entitled Maintain Momentum. I chose this title as I firmly believe the Corps is on the right path under force design. A few points from that document. First, I believe that the Corps must continue to strike a balance between high-end modernization and our commitment to persistent, forward-deployed Naval Expeditionary Forces that campaign and com respond to crises globally. This effort is represented by our Marine Expeditionary Units. Second, we must prioritize our operations with the Navy and its amphibious ships, and we must provide Marines with the organic mobility to rapidly maneuver from shore to shore, ship to shore, and back again. Third, on recruiting, our performance speaks for itself. We will continue to make mission without ever diminishing our standards. Additionally, our top performing Marines are reenlisting at historic rates, and we must sustain this trend. Fourth, we must maximize the capability of our reserves to ensure that our nation has the ready bench of warriors that they relied on, have relied on since the founding of the Marine Corps Forces Reserve in 1916. And fifth, I'm dedicated to ensuring a quality of life for our Marines that matches the high demands we place on them every day. That means nutritious food, high quality and accessible gyms, and a safe, quiet place to recover from a hard day's work. Our Barracks 2030 initiative is our most consequential barracks investment ever and it is sorely needed. While aggressively pursuing these priorities, I commit to you that our Corps will always be frugal and accountable with the resources that you and the American people provide. I'm proud of my Marines and civilian Marines who enabled the Marine Corps to receive an unmodified audit opinion earlier this year, the first of any service to do so. They told us what we have long known, that when you entrust us with the taxpayer's money, it is money well spent and fully accounted for. All these things are critical to maintaining the strength and dominance of your Marine Corps. This year marks 249 years since the founding of our Corps. That is 249 years of battles won and peace upheld in the name of democracy and prosperity for our nation and for all nations who abide by the international rules-based order. But increasingly, world events demonstrate that this order is being challenged. Free trade, unrestricted access to the seas, peaceful cooperation between nations, big and small, are under assault. Our nation's prosperity is underwritten by a strong Navy and Marine Corps who maintain a global presence and keep malign actors at bay. Thank you again for the opportunity to represent your Marines today. I pledge to continue to work closely with each of you to ensure your Marine Corps remains the most lethal fighting force on the planet. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Before I recognize myself for questions, I want to acknowledge the presence of a special guest today. We've got a former long-term member of this committee uh, and also a uh, a classmate of mine and a retired Marine Colonel, John Klein, with us today. Good to have you, John. Uh, now I recognize myself for questions. Uh, Admiral Franchetti and General Smith, um, the Navy and Marines FY25 budget has $4.5 billion in unfunded uh, requirements. So it's clear you've had to leave some important programs on the cutting table. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you uh, to speak to some of the trade-offs that you've made trying to make this budget number work. Admiral, I'll start with you. Well, thank you, Chairman Rogers. And I said in my opening statement, you know, we really prioritized, you know, Columbia first and then readiness and then our people, quality of service and everything that they need to be able what to do their jobs. What could you not make But the fit? things that I couldn't uh, really get after is, you know, we took, uh, risk in our future procurement. Uh, if you look, the things that, you know, we weren't able to do in the future, really the air wing of the future, you know, aircraft carriers, uh, SSNX, DDGX. So really we prioritized on the current uh, readiness that we need uh, and did not prioritize the future. So if there were uh, additional resources available, certainly my UPL, 
uh, has items on there that either came up after our budget was submitted, but the things that are on there are things that we need to accelerate or to get some more fighting advantage. The last thing I would mention is, uh, although I have prioritized investment in our foundation, which is installations uh, and everything associated with our infrastructure, about 60% of our MILCOM budget is going into the SIOP program, and so I think there will always be opportunity to provide more investment in our installations. General Smith. Mr. Chairman, our UPL does two things. It accelerates modernization against a pacing threat who is moving at an alarming pace. It accelerates quality of life improvements, our Barracks 2030 initiative. And frankly, the risk, if not funded, is we will remain capable and ready, but deferred funding will eventually be paid for in blood by our Marines in crisis or in combat or in training. In the near term, our success in recruiting and retention is jeopardized because we won't be able to fulfill commitments to Marines and their families. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Secretary, uh, the review found every major shipbuilding program is experiencing significant delays and um, challenges. Can you speak to how you plan to correct that? Absolutely, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, let me say that these are concerns that I've had from the first month that I became Secretary of the Navy, trying to address the most difficult challenges and trying to make improvements to get us to a better place. Uh, I'm pleased to say that due to the support of the Congress and the administration, we are now pumping eight, nearly $18 billion into the submarine base, $1 billion into the surface industrial base as well, too. And just in 24, some of the advancements that were made established in an additive manufacturing center down at Danville, 9,700 workers hired across both uh, GD Electric Boat and uh, HII uh, uh, Newport News, installation of uh, additive manufacturing parts. Uh, groundbreaking on the submarine manufacturing facility at uh, Newport News, for example, strategically outsourcing three million hours of work from the prime vendors to the sub vendors, something that I've been encouraging them to do from the very beginning. And we hope to actually double that in fiscal year 25, along with increasing other strategic sourcing as well to scaling of attract, attraction, recruiting, training, and retention efforts. As you know, Mr. Chairman, we've had, again, thanks to the support of Congress, $25 million uh, retention um, uh, uh, money that's been passed to Fink and Terry, for example, so they can retain more people. We see another $25 million added to the 25 budget. So there are a lot of good news stories that are trying to be uh, executed upon in order to get uh, the state of these production lines up to where they should be. Uh, thank you. We used to execute uh, heel-to-toe amphibious deployments in two AORs. Uh, now we struggle to maintain one deployment in one AOR. Can you talk about what you're doing to correct that? Yes, Mr. Chairman. In fact, if my memory serves me right, I think it was sometime in the 2017-2018 time frame where we actually had a, a heel-to-toe deployment of an ARG. Uh, since then, we've, we've unquestionably have been challenged by maintenance pro uh, problems with our amphibious ships. And there's no question in my mind that we should have been buying more amphibious ships earlier. Uh, the age of our amphibious uh, fleet is excessively high. Uh, we need to continue to invest in new ships to replace these old ships. If you take the Germantown, which we're proposing decommissioning this year, for example, she is our oldest LSD. She has wood decks on her that are corroding. She has a crane that hasn't been able to be fixed in the past six years, and that's with help of the OEM, the original manufacturer. So it's time to actually replace these older LSDs with new ones uh, in order to be able to meet the missions uh, that face us tomorrow. Great. Thank you. I yield to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. I continue along those lines in terms of the, the shipbuilding challenges and particularly focus on the, on the workforce piece of it. Um, and I don't know exactly, um, so I'm curious, how big a factor is that in not being able to, to keep up and having so many of our uh, ships behind? It, it is a significant chapter, uh, a factor, Mr. Chairman. Um, the blue-collar workforce in this country has actually uh, decreased significantly over the course of the last decade, I would argue. And we actually need to take measures uh, in a whole of maritime statecraft effort, quite frankly, to try to recruit more people to the shipbuilding industry. Our country doesn't have a commercial shipbuilding industry either. That significantly hurts the status of naval shipbuilding in the country. And that's what we're trying to get back to, try to go after the long-hanging fruit to try to retrain more people. Um, my members from my office just came from Ohio 
uh, just a few days ago, for example, a meeting with the Boilermakers Union of Ohio to try to get them to be able to retrain people at Bartlett uh, Shipyard, for example, and so that they could actually go into the shipbuilding industry. There's about 4,000 uh, Boilermakers in the in the is, is there a way to quantify this? Are we like we need 10,000 workers? Or we need 20,000? Understanding that it's going to differ specialty to specialty, but in general, is there a number that either you or the admiral could give us on how short we are here? I think we need, we're going to need upwards of 50,000 or more ship shipyard workers into the future to be able to constitute the demand signal that uh, we're putting in. Have we worked at all with um, high schools on, you know, beginning to show people the, you know, basically career and technical education to say, because I know there's been a bit of a pivot certainly in my area, and we have a robust, you know, shipbuilding industry there. Um, we're building a maritime high school, which focuses on a number of different issues. Um, but, you know, an effort to take people in high school and say, hey, this is a career that you could pursue. So we're taking a significant amount of investment from the submarine industrial base and the ship industrial base. And Chairman Courtney knows that up in Connecticut, for example, we're pumping that money into retraining programs so that we can actually take high school students, turn them into certified welders, and put them right into the shipyard. We're doing the same thing with community colleges as well, too. I just visited a community college up in Maine, in Bath, Maine, for example, where we're trying to do the same thing. Okay, and on the requirements piece, what can we do? I mean, it just seems to me like that does drive cost. And then to the chairman's point, requirements shift for a variety of different reasons in the middle of a project. But even before we get to the shifting, just the set of requirements that are thrown up as a starting point. Is anyone taking a serious look at that? And I'd be interested in all three of you just giving a quick comment. How can we shrink that down so that we can be more nimble in how we meet our, our manufacturing needs? It's a complicated... Uh it's a complicated situation, and yes, of course, it it's made even more complicated over the years because every time you have a new operational requirement, it adds additional requirements to the factor as well, too. When you take it, just as one example, we, we want to operate more in the Arctic, right? Well, our DDGs, for example, are only designed to operate a certain set number of days in the Arctic. But if we're going to operate more in the Arctic, we've got to reinforce those holes on our DG Flight 3s, for example, and our DG Xs in order for them to be able to do so. So there are times when there are legitimate growth and requirements to support an operational mission. But in many cases, it's also telling the shipyard how to do their job. And we shouldn't be doing that. We should be setting the overall requirements and letting them build to those requirements as well, too. Sometimes safety factors uh, are at play as well, too, and uh, lawyers get involved, and, and so, you know, one lawsuit drives 100 different additional requirements to the, uh, to the process as well. Absolutely. It, just very quickly, in time I have left, Admiral General Smith, you want to offer thoughts? I would just offer that it's really important, you know, as we are designing the ships initially and setting the requirements, uh, both, you know, as we just did with the landing ship medium, you know, to really think through that, work very carefully with the uh, concept of employment that we're going to use and make sure that we're basically saying exactly what we need for those capabilities when we release that RFP. Great. General, just I would echo what my shipmate said, that uh, our Wargaming and Analysis Center is vital to that to war game through what actually you need before you set the requirements. And then our requirements officer, Lieutenant General Heckel, is there to keep those requirements on pace and to keep them steady. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. <clears throat> Chair, now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And indeed, we are so grateful to have with us today uh, Congressman Colonel John Klein of Minnesota. Uh, he served with such distinction and still does. And so it, it's so good to see his bright face here today. Thank you. Uh, with that, too, uh, I want to thank each of you for your uh, service. Um, I grew up with a great appreciation of the Navy and the holy city of Charleston, South Carolina, uh, with the Navy base there. I was a sea cadet, uh, and so I, I saw firsthand uh, the great work. And then I'm also grateful to be a, today, a Navy dad. And my uh, son is an orthopedic surgeon in the Navy. Uh, and then for everyone, uh, and military service can be so uplifting. Uh, I now, uh, with his service in Naples, Italy, I've got three grandchildren who speak perfect Italian. And so uh, who would ever imagine the ripple effect of uh, military service? And then, General, I'm really grateful. I previously represented Paris Island, uh, Marine Corps uh, Air Station Beaufort, uh, and I, I saw young recruits come uh, and to be totally transformed uh, from what they were uh, into uh, Marines having uh, very uh, meaningful lives. And so it's, it's just a, um, an extraordinary uh, opportunity that you provide for the young people of our country as we defend our country. 
And uh, Secretary Toro, the Missile Defense Agency's budget request for fiscal year 25 cuts the procurement of standard missile 3 or SM3 Block 1B interceptors, which is our Navy's primary defense against tactical ballistic missiles for the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense Weapon System. This deviates from last year's budget request, which set procurement of these interceptors through fiscal year 29. I'm concerned that this proposal was drafted prior to the commencement of the Ill outrageous and illegal attacks on Israel by Iran and its puppets on October 7, 2023 and beyond. Where these SM Block 31B interceptors have been expended to protect American troops and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. With the current trajectory to end production of this proven defense against the threats in the CINCOM region, will this create a gap of defense capability, and what is the Department going to do to address the gap? Congressman, thanks for that uh, really important question. Um, I truly believe that um, SM3s will be needed in greater numbers in the future. Given the operations that took place in defense of Israel uh, here recently where some were fired, uh, and very effectively so. Um, I think given the future threat and our deterrence um, mission in the Indo-Pacific, we are going to need more SM3s in the future, and I think that those decisions were made before recent operations. I think we're going to have to relook that uh, in order to add more SM3s uh, in the future. And, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, because it really is shocking to me. Uh, here we are at the 21st century uh, with the Iran uh, missile attacks on the, on the citizens of uh, Israel. And then you have the Houthis, uh, puppets of Iran, uh, with their capabilities, underwater sea capabilities that, uh, of uh, nomads. Uh, no, no, hey, uh, we're dealing with the dictators uh, with rule of gun invading democracy's rule of law, uh, whether it be war criminal Putin, whether it be the regime in Tehran, whether it be uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, we've just got to be prepared and uh, address the changes that occur. Additionally, uh, with the hearings that we've had, uh, the uh, integrated air and missile defense ballistic systems that we have, um, there has been a dialogue between the departments of uh, integrating the unmanned aerial systems uh, with the Aegis uh, ballistic missile defense architecture. Uh, is, is that proceeding? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Congressman. Can you repeat it? You're talking about integrated unmanned aerial systems yes, with yes, the yes. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, yes. So, for, uh, as one example, we're very excited, obviously, by you know the current operations associated with MQ4, MQ9, and in the future MQ25. Uh, we, we are very much uh, planning the integration of MQ25, for example, with the integrated air missile defense systems, so that we can recognize that the MQ25 is operating out there as an unmanned F-18 refueler. Uh, while we're actually protecting the entire carrier strike group. Well, it, it, again, as we face uh, the changes, it's just so startling. Again, in the 21st century, this shouldn't be occurring. Uh, and finally, uh, Admiral Lisa, uh, and I'm really grateful there's a future sailor preparatory course at Fort Jackson, giving uh, young people an opportunity to serve. Is the Navy looking, has been successful, you need to contact General Kelly. Uh, is, um, is that being pursued by the Navy? Uh, yes, Congressman Wilson, we have also a future sailor prep course modeled on the Army's course for both physical fitness and academic, and it is uh, having a really positive impact for here, here. our Thank future you. sailors. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I want to thank all the witnesses for being here today. Um, Secretary Del Toro, we had good news last night on AUKUS where the State Department issued their ITAR regulations to implement the optimal pathway that you and I witnessed out in San Diego. It's great to see uh, Admiral Franchetti. Congratulations on your first hearing and really want to, you know, welcome uh, General Smith back into the fray and uh, really glad uh, you're back in the saddle uh, leading the, the Marine Corps. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I begin my question, I, I request unanimous consent to enter in the record two letters uh, from the Machinist Union and the Metal Trades Department of the AFL-CIO urging sustained investment in the two pre-year cadence of the Virginia-class submarine. Without objection, so ordered. They represent the welders, electricians, painters, and boilermakers who are hard at work right now delivering three Virginia-class submarines in this calendar year and on track to deliver two more in 2025 and are part of that job training initiative that the Secretary mentioned in New England, uh, 5,300 
100 hires uh, last calendar year with an 86% um, retention rate. I also request unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter that myself and 119 other House members submitted to the Appropriations Committee last night in support of restoring the second Virginia class submarine. Without objection. Thank you. Um, Admiral uh, Franchetti, um, we've had our posture hearings in over the last month or so, as the chairman mentioned. Uh, we heard from Admiral Aquilino at Indopaycom, General Giat from Northcom, and General Cavoli from UCOM that their requirements for attack submarine missions extend beyond what the Navy current has uh, in its inventory. Again, um, the Navy's shipbuilding 30-year plan uh, has a requirement for 66 attack submarines, um, and uh, at this point we possess about 50, maybe 51 with the New Jersey that was delivered last week. Um, is that still the Navy's position, that that's the, the target in terms of what uh, should be uh, an adequate attack submarine fleet? Yes, I can't speak highly enough of our attack submarine fleet, really our asymmetric, asymmetric advantage. And as you said, yes, 66 is our, our requirement. Thank you. So, Mr. Secretary, um, during the budget briefs back in March, um, Navy officials said, quote, we were going about the submarine cut in a strategic way because we're simply not taking a submarine out. We're also continuing investment in advanced procurement to make sure that the supplier industrial base is fully funded. Unfortunately, committee staff has dug deeper into the budget books, and it's clear that many, many suppliers are not included in the advanced procurement phase of construction and are not protected by this strategic way. Our staff determined that it would cost an additional $1 billion to achieve the goal that was stated uh, with the Navy's budget brief. When this enormous shortfall was raised at the Sea Power Subcommittee two weeks ago, Assistant Secretary Girton replied, well, we'll have to take a closer look and see what we can do to help. Does the Navy today have an answer to these supply chain companies, which again, the analysis shows are not going to be protected the way it was intended? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first also reaffirm our complete commitment on the part of the entire Department of the Navy to the 66 attack submarines. We currently have 50. Uh, we have 11 that are actually under construction and four additional ones under contract. And I'm confident with the 26 uh, uh, budget, we'll eventually get to the 66 that are required. Um, of course, we need to have them built faster and have those production rates increase. With regards specifically to these vendors, uh, we're in constant con contact with these vendors. The purpose of advanced procurement money, however, isn't to fully fund all the vendors that are in the supply chain. It's to fund those vendors that are most critical to the supply chain. I don't think there's ever been a confirmation that we can support, you know, full funding of all the vendors across the entire so, spectrum. Mr. Secretary, if I could just say my time is running out. I know some of those critical mm -hmm. supply chain companies, they are left out, okay, with the plan that was submitted by the Navy. They are, they are picked up through full, the full funding phase of the submarine program, not advanced procurement long lead items. And, and again, this is a real problem, which again, we now have dollars and cents in terms of what it would take to fix that. Not a penny of that would go to the general contractor uh, that $1 billion, that was all, again, to, to make sure that all these, you know, fabricators and um, parts manufacturers are actually going to be protected, as Mr. Raven had indicated in his, um, in his opening statement. And again, at some point, to really protect them, we should, we should just go forward with what was in the plant, the fit up last year to have two submarines included in this year's budget. We are going to work really hard with, the, with your team to try and accomplish that goal. Uh, we've done it in the past. We did it in 2013 when the Obama administration uh, eliminated a submarine, and in 2020 when the Trump administration eliminated a submarine. Sometimes it was in the UPL's list, sometimes it wasn't. But we, using our constitutional duty, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 13 to provide and maintain a Navy, we stepped forward and filled that gap. And we're, it's a good thing we did. With that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. Secretary Deotor, I want to begin with you. We know that in the Indo Pacific, in order to deter conflict, this is the tip of the spear effort. It's a Navy Marine Corps fight. In order to do that, we have to have ships. Listen, our sailors and Marines are great, but until they can walk on water, we better be building them ships. We know that the entire effort there needs to be about the existing Navy and building new ships. The President's budget comes over this year. Build six, retire 19. Ten of those before the end of their expected service life. I'm not a mathematician, but it seems to me you can't do addition by subtraction. We know that... There's continued cost growth and schedule movement to the right in building new ships. So 
if we're not going to repair the ships we have and we're going to be delayed in getting new ships, it seems like to me the delta will get even bigger. And I've warned for years that there are real consequences to this. If you look at what's going to happen just in the Hampton Roads area, one of the, one of the, the great places for ship repair, from FY18 to FY28, we'll have a reduction in workload demand there by 50 percent. Employment levels there will go from 7,800 ship repairs to 3,800 ship repairs. We know once those people leave, they're not coming back. So, Mr. Secretary, what do you have in mind for the capacity of our U.S. repair yards? How do, how do we maintain an, a Navy? How do we make sure that we as members of Congress who have a constitutional responsibility, the Constitution says to maintain navies. How do we maintain them if this demand signal goes away and we have this massive decrease in the number of ships that we're going to keep on when we need them. How, how does that work? Tell me, what, what's the Navy's plan going forward to sustain our Navy? Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. First and foremost, as you know, the debt discussions that took place here on Capitol Hill led to the Fiscal Responsibility Act that actually puts excessive downward pressure on the United States Navy. And part of that is actually then having to make the choice to Decommission the legacy ships. I, I, hate, I hate, hate to interrupt, but it, it's, it's it's. I know, but this is it's, a complicated it's, it's discussion. The broader, it's the broader constitutional responsibility that we have to defend this nation. I understand about the Fiscal Responsibility Act, but it is about making priority decisions on the resources that. But we I have to make those priority decisions based on the law. Now, if the law does not allow me to spend more money than the one percent increase over last year's budget. I then have to make says really maintain tough. Maintain our navies. Maintain our navies. Is what the Constitution says. But the laws are what I have to follow on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, and so I have to actually take a look at retiring legacy systems so that we could actually build new ships, and we're building 58 of them across the fit. None of those example. come into operation, though, inside the future year defense plan. So all of our dreams are going to come true outside. You'll be long gone, and somebody else is going to be That's saying, right. well, I, I'd, I'd have gotten to the and Navy if I didn't, didn't have to deal with what was given to me prior to. And to the chairman's point, I'm trying to work with industry to increase the production rates, for example. The New, US, New Jersey, for example, was delivered just last week, and it was delivered almost three years late. If all the submarines that we had ordered actually had been delivered online because of the challenges to the production rates, yeah. We'd actually have five additional submarines in our fleet today to be able to meet our operational needs across the nation. So we have to work an entire whole of government, maritime statecraft, to actually try to bring these production rates back up so that we can get the ships delivered on time and on budget, and so that we can keep them operational at sea and actually free up those shipyards so when they do need to come back and be repaired, they could be made available. We're also invest making historic investments in the PSYOP program, for example, $20 billion thanks to the support of the Congress over these last 10 years. And those programs are moving along very nicely, obviously, but these are programs that haven't been invested in in over 75 years. And so those are the investments that we are making that I think are truly historic that hopefully will get us to the right place. But it's going to, get to it's going to take time to get us there, and there's nothing I can do. I can't snap my fingers and have these ships built faster. But I, I understand about new construction, but we've got we to gotta have the maintainers. If we're going to let the maintenance side atrophy, when you do get those new ships, where are the repairs going to come from? So then we're going to be in a situation of being able to maintain a 355-ship Navy if and when we ever, ever get there. So there is the maintenance side of the formula that I think is critically important. I would argue probably today even more important than the build side. I understand the delays in the build side. All those things are, are, are reality. L let, me, let, me, let me ask you this. Admiral Franchetti, I wanted, wanted to get your perspective on where we are with SSN uh, projections, building one submarine. Now, the Australians look at that and they go, well, wait a minute. We, we thought we had an AUKUS agreement here. We thought we were going to build two a year. We thought we were going to be able to buy some from the United States. How do we, how do we sustain the fundamentals of the AUKUS agreement, if you were an Australian and looked at this and go, is the U.S. really serious about this? They're going out to building one submarine this year when they say we need to have a pace of 2.3? And they look at it and go, I thought we were going to buy some submarines from them. I thought we were actually going to have a, a, a cooperative agreement there. Uh, how do you see this as being able to sustain? Gentleman's time has expired. Fleet? Chair, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Gary Mindy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So many things here. Um, money, money, or not enough money. Uh, we had four and a half billion dollars of unfunded priorities. I think you mentioned that, Admiral. Uh, I would point out to the committee that uh, the Sentinel program has been none McCurdy, stopped. Four and a half, four point six billion dollars is expected to be spent on it this year. Maybe that could be delayed and spent uh, on the Navy. 
maybe, if this committee decides what should be done. We make choices here about prioritization. The fact of the matter is we do not need the Sentinel for at least another decade and a half. But this is the Navy. You do build Columbia-class submarines, don't you? Yes, sir. At about uh, seven to eight billion dollars a copy, Sentinel's 137 billion over the next decade plus. That's about eight Columbia-class submarines. If we had the shipyards, which unfortunately uh, my colleague Mr. Waltz is not here, he's he and the uh, subcommittee on readiness has developed a. Uh, Interim National Maritime Strategy that speaks to the commercial side of it, which is also the shipyard side and the ability of our shipyards to uh, produce uh, ships on the commercial side, but also to uh, repair naval ships. So there's an overarching strategy that we're working on here. Um, General Smith, welcome back. Delighted you're here. Delighted you appear to be in great health. Thank you. Um, you've always fancied, and you've told me, and I'm sure others, that the Marine Corps is fast and light, capable, able to operate independently as part of an integrated joint force. What capabilities is the Marine Corps pursuing to enable that mobility in contested environments? What do you need to carry out that goal? Well, Mr. Garamendi, thanks for the, for the warm welcome. Uh, it's, it's good to be back. Um, what we need is a landing ship medium. Um, the uh, request for proposal is out for industry now and we can't go fast enough. Uh, landing ship medium uh, built to commercial standards um, and I'm pleased with the uh, FY25 shipbuilding plan, which is 11222. Um, I'll use the Ford F-150 analogy. Uh, it's based on existing commercial standards and the requirement uh, for this is 35 with the initial purchase of 18, and they will provide more littoral mobility for the stand-in forces. They're low signature, they're rapid, and they can carry with them our medium missile batteries, which are a requirement to deter the People's Republic of China. Uh, very good. Uh, you mentioned commercial standards. Unfortunately, the ranking member stepped away. He's way into standards right now. I was listening to him early on. I assume those commercial standards would relieve part of the problem that he was talking about. I believe they would, sir. Admiral Franchetti, um, one of my favorite subjects, and I know you're aware of it, has to do with the ability of the shipyards to actually conduct their work. In order for those shipyards to be efficient and effective, they have to know well ahead of time what the incoming availability that is ship needs to be done. Could you... Uh, help me understand how the Navy is uh, in real time keeping track of what every ship needs to be done in an availability. Thank you, Congressman Garamendi. You know, our shipyards do need that information ahead of time. And one of the things that we've been focused on through the NAVC enterprise is identifying all of that work uh, along the way through the port engineer, the type commander, and working with all the different program executive offices on whatever modernization needs to be done in the shipyard to develop that full package. Our objective is to have that package locked in uh, 120 days before a, deploy uh, before a shipyard availability begins so the shipyard can plan, so we can get the materials that we need to be able to do that so we don't have unnecessary delays or growth work because that's where you start to see the delays. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary DeToro. Uh, thank you for visiting Mare Island. Uh, and I would point out to the committee that uh, the privately owned shipyards have, the, have a program available through MARAD to upgrade their shipyards. However, the amount of money that is available through the ongoing budget is minuscule. Gentleman's time's expired. Chair, not recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you all for being here. Uh, Secretary Del Toro and uh, Admiral Franchetti, the next questions will be for you. The U.S. Navy has been tasked with the critical mission of keeping Red Sea commercial shipping lanes open by neutralizing Houthi missile and drone attacks. Could you briefly describe this mission for the committee? And then the activity appears to have died down over the past month, but how do you assess the threat moving forward? 
Mr. Chairman, it's an incredibly important mission, as you know, one that we've been conducting for six and a half months with uh, close to 200 engagements with the Houthis uh, of drones and missiles shot at our ships directly and also at innocent merchant mariners throughout the Red Sea. Uh, regretfully, it has uh, resulted in probably about a 70 percent decrease in merchant traffic through the Red Sea. It's our responsibility to do the very best that we can to protect American lives and protect the lives of those innocent mar mariners, obviously, and to keep those ships from being attacked. And I think our Navy has responded brilliantly in doing so without any loss of life on U.S. Navy ships that have been attacked. We regretfully have lost three Special Forces uh, operators, obviously, that were on the USS Polar. But uh, perhaps the CNO can expand on that. Yes, thank you. I just also wanted to add, you know, through Operation Prosperity Guardian, it's really, a, you know, U.S. Navy leadership of a coalition of folks that are doing the uh, maritime security mission through the Red Sea and in the Gulf of Aden. We're also coordinating with the EU mission, which is called a Speedies, uh, to make sure that we have an integrated plan, uh, you know, with them to, to deconflict any uh, potential um, you know, both of us escorting the same things. So I think this operation has gone really well. Really proud of the team. Uh, you know, we've learned a lot through this. Um, we've embarked on uh, expeditionary resupply. Uh, everything that we're learning in the Red Sea and through this operation against a very challenging Houthi threat uh, is some things that we can replicate and learn from in uh, other areas of the world. Okay. When reviewing the fiscal year 25 budget request, I was surprised to see that the number of SM6s that you are uh, procuring, considering the heightened activity in the Red Sea, the budget request just seems insufficient to meet the need. Would you agree? Congressman, we've actually uh, emphasized uh, the growth in SM2 missile production, which is the majority of the missiles that we're actually shooting. The SM6s are essential missiles as well as are the SM3s. They take a lot longer to actually build, uh, which is part of the reason why we haven't invested more money into them until the production rates can come up to a point where we could actually invest more money to buy more, more, more SM6s and SM3s as well, too. Okay. You, you mentioned, touched on it briefly earlier, can you discuss the Navy's plan to field directed energy weapons and high energy lasers to support maritime missile defense? Yes, sir. We've accelerated um, the development and the testing of the Helios laser program, which in many ways is a replacement, not a replacement, but it supplements the uh, SeaWiz system. Uh, we also have six other uh, laser projects and high energy um, projects, some of which are classified and I can't talk about openly. But uh, this is a high priority area for us. Uh, we obviously, well into the future, cannot continue to shoot down drones with simply SM2s and SM6s. We need to develop the high energy, high lasers, and, and directed energy uh, programs to be able to counter these uh, air drones that are being shot at us as well. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman, and to the witnesses for being here today, uh, Secretary Del Toro, it we were commissioning a ship down in uh, Key West uh, last year, and on the way down there, I sat next to a young lady who happened to be a teacher, and I came up that what her children are going to do. And she said, well, my one wants to go to college, the other one wants to, uh, you know, become a mechanic. And the, immediately went to the issue of what we're talking about today. Where is our next generation of worker who work with their hands and their head come from? And she said something that I will not forget. We need to give our children the permission to pursue an area that they're interested in, whether it's to be a lawyer, a doctor, or an electrician. Permission to do that. Because the narrative in our country today is you got to go to college to make it. Where we, you know, in the process of taking away debt for those who went to college. But for those who go to work in the shipyard, they get nothing. I think we as a society have this wrong. Whether you want to become a lawyer or you want to become a welder, we value those the same. And until we as a nation value those things the same way, we're not going to get the people in the shipyard the way we need it. We look at them many times as a society as second class. I know that, and I see that. So when we talk about that next 50,000, we as a nation have to value that for what it is and do that. 
You talk about the blue collar workforce being reduced over the last 50 years, and it has. The number one reason is we offshored those items, that manufacturing that we did. We did that to ourselves, chasing the dollar instead of the capacity. So here we are trying to build it back up and wondering why we can't get there. Well, I think we need to look in the mirror and say, we need to make sure that capacity goes on here. We need friends, we need allies, and we need to work with them. But we need to have the capacity here long term, not just for two days. So after that rant, we're sitting here, and I want to thank uh, the Admiral for visiting the Philadelphia, South Jersey Yard, the capacity that we have there. And we had this very conversation when we were there. Why can't we get those people? The Philadelphia Repair Yard is literally talking about closing because they can't get enough work. The work that's going on there today is with the USS New Jersey that we retired almost 25 years ago. They're doing it, but after that, their work isn't there. So Mr. Whitman talked about that repair. We have to send the demand signals. Why would I want to go to work someplace that's going to shut down in two years? So other than money, Secretary Del Toro and to each of uh, the general and the admiral, what can we do other than money to send the right signals to get that workforce that we value them? How do you do that? Well, Congressman, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, and I've been calling for a call to National Maritime Service, uh, not just to, to uniform service, obviously, in the Marine Corps and the Navy, uh, and through our recruiting efforts, um, but also to increase the number of civilians that we her have working in the Department of the Navy and in our shipyards as well, too, because it is honorable service, as you know. And uh, we need electricians, we need plumbers, we need uh, welders, fitters, we need everything to build these great ships. But in my call to a National Maritime Statecraft, I think resurgence of the commercial shipbuilding industry would also help tremendously so. And it would help the economy, it would help create more jobs across the entire country. We have essentially have given up on commercial shipbuilding in China, and thank God our allies in Japan and, North, and South Korea have also invested heavily in shipbuilding. But we have lost that art here in the United States. We can't even build our own LNG ships here in the United States, for example, when we should be building them. So I think it's also complicated by uh, some of our immigration policies. We need to increase legal immigration. We need to increase work visa programs to allow other workers coming from other countries to come here as well and fill these jobs that are being unfilled. The good news is that unemployment is under 4 percent across the entire country. The challenge, however, is that we need more workers uh, to, to continue to feed our growing economy. And so that's the challenge that we have, and I think uh, a national call to maritime service is what I'm committed to. If, if I may, in addition to those leaving the service, recruiting them to go back to work because many of them continue to work for years after that. And more importantly than that is the number one way, other than telling them of their value, is to pay them the right wages. And with that, I yield back. In complete agreement with that statement, uh, the uh, chair and I recognize a gentleman from Mississippi, uh, the general. Yeah, I want to concur with a lot of the thoughts. Listen, we can blame it on money, we can blame it on budgets, but for the last three years, we've asked to give away more ships than we're bringing. So it's not just that thing. And here's what I will say. We have to have a consistent message to our shipbuilders that we're going to build ships. We can't change that. We can't change the requirements. We have to send a constant message that we're going to continue because we will never get our workforce in place if we continue to say we're going to do a strategic pause on amphibs, we're going to do a strategic pause on Virginia class, you've got to let them catch up to get on schedule. We never allow them to get on schedule. With that being said, Admiral Franchetti, um, what the heck is going on with the boxer? I mean, she underwent a $200 million overhaul in 2022 and hasn't been underway since. In fact, she really hadn't been out of the dock in five years. So what is going on with the USS Boxer? Thank you, Congressman Kelly. Let me, I'll give you an update on the Boxer. So, you know, the Boxer did actually go through all of her uh, workups for a deployment. Uh, she headed out, but now she's back in San Diego. Uh, she has a bearing on her starboard rudder uh, that is not uh, it's not in good condition, so it needs to be replaced. So we are basically, right now, she is there. Uh, we are evaluating the different 
procedures that will be done to repair her. It's about right now about a four to six week repair. Uh, we look to be able to finish that repair pier side. The bearing is available and, uh, and then get her back out on deployment. I would say that we're still investigating the cause of the bearing, but it was either potentially installed uh, improperly or the bearing itself was uh, had some type of defect. So we're going to continue that inquiry. Um, Thank right you. Now. Let, let me get to General Smith. How does the boxer's unavailability impact the Marine Corps? Congressman, we're, we're designed to operate on a three-ship amphibious ready group, uh, one big deck LHA, LHD, and two, two small boys, two LPDs. Um, so when you lose your big deck, you lose most of your aviation assets, and you lose your crisis response force. You also lose the ability to train and exercise those Marines also, is that correct? That is correct, sir. All right, I, I wanna talk a little bit, uh, without the 31 amphibious ships and 35 landing ships, can the Marine Corps fight, survive, and meet combatant commander requirements uh, as a stand-in force? Sir, we, we cannot. Um, we, we need those uh, agree, agreed upon uh, 31 amphibs and the CNO and I have locked shields on that and we're determined to get there. And I want to talk a little bit about the LSM or the medium landing ship. Uh, we've got that. We do not need, and, and I know you agree with me, Commandant, we do not need to turn that into the Navy's version of Pentagon Wars. We don't need to create uh, something that's going to be so expensive and uh, to, to, to be survivable. The Marine Corps has asked for a requirement, and I think we should trust the Marine Corps to build them the ship that they asked for because you know how to employ those. Is that correct, uh, Commandant? Sir, that is correct. And all the considerations that other people are taking to create this into something different, uh, those, are those being asked for by you, Commandant, or did you ask for the requirement that you need as the Commandant of the Marine Corps? Uh, Congressman, I, I asked for the requirement that is, that is required for them to be survivable, mobile, and beachable. Absolutely. And I guess, um, I think, Secretary Del Toro, I think we've made some progress, but I do think that we need to be very careful about when we do a 30-year shipbuilding plan, that the first 10 years are locked in and we never move those or five years, I don't know what that number is, but what we do is we keep shifting year one and we can't do that. We have to send a consistent demand signal to industry or they will never be able to keep up with the maintenance or the shipbuilding that is required. So I hope that you guys will understand. We have to build what we're building. We can't change that. Uh, can, can I get a commitment to do that, Secretary Del Toro? Mr. Chairman, I, I have uh, I've tried to keep that commitment since the day I came in as Secretary of the Navy. And for the first three years until this budget, I haven't been able to, I've been able to do that where no numbers of ships have changed in the first 10 years of the shipbuilding uh, plan. However, it is the Fiscal Responsibility Act that was passed by the Congress and, again, in response to the very difficult negotiations that were done around the debt limit that forced our hand this year to be able to have to remove that one submarine in a situation where it simply could not be delivered by the shipyards. And that's opportunity cost. Opportunity cost Gentlemen's on time's resources. Gentlemen's time expired. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Golden. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, last month Admiral Pitts testified that one Flight 3 DDG-51 uh, to date, um, only one has been delivered to the fleet. Uh, he also expressed the importance of fielding the new capabilities that come with Aegis Baseline 10 and the Spy 6 radar. Uh, of course, before Congress passed an FY24 appropriates bill, the administration requested two DDGs in the President's uh, budget request. Uh, now that we have a 24 approach uh, through into law, and it included $1.3 billion for advanced procurement, uh, it seems to me like that's a clear indication from Congress, not to mention just a lot of the work of the committee over the last several years, uh, that Congress wants to speed the delivery of Flight 3 ships. Um, is that is that a priority that you agree with? Would you agree that Congress should be trying to speed the del delivery of Flight 3 to the Navy fleet? To the extent that it doesn't take away from other uh, requirements sure. that I have to meet across the Department of the Navy, yes, I always welcome more DDG Flight 3s into the Navy. Yep, more ships is good. All right. Um, Mr. Kelly just stole the question I was going to ask you, but I guess I'll just reiterate 
I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is you would commit to adhering to the, the five-year plan uh, on the landing ships uh, in, in procuring procuring eight of them, uh, assuming Congress gives you the resources you need. It's a priority for the Navy as well as the Marine Corps, right? Congressman, I've been a big supporter of the LSM, and I've worked to try to accelerate the LSM schedule as much as possible. We had to go through some very difficult survivability discussions. I think we're in the right place supporting the, the comment on the Marine Corps and the requirements that are set forth, uh, which the CNO agrees with as well, too. So we're united in the future of the LSM. We're committed to building the uh, 18 LSMs uh, initially, eventually to get to 35, but we want to be able to get these first few out to ex have the Marine Corps continue to exper experiment with them and make sure that they're the final design before we go to advanced procurement for the 35. I think it's no secret that some members of Congress or appropriators, authorizers are out there talking about whether or not we should be adhering to these uh, caps that you keep referring to. Um, it's not necessarily your decision, but I mean, in, in a perfect world, you would not be structuring a budget based upon these caps. Does that sound right? Well, that's correct, Congressman. Obviously, would would spend to the amount that the Congress authorizes and appropriates. Sure, um, and I think Mr. Norcross touched upon this. I mean, there's been a pretty good focus today on talking about uh, the need to really focus on shipbuilding, uh, shipbuilders, and developing a workforce that can meet the needs of the Navy and our national security. Um, I've tried to do a lot of work on that uh, through the years uh, with reporting requirements. It seems like maybe you're actually benefiting from some of the reporting that Navy has done uh, as a result of that uh, and have a good understanding of, of where we're at and where we need to be. Um, I just want to reiterate again, my office is even hearing from uh, shipyards in the Philly region uh, who do repairs and maintenance that they're, they're getting ready to, to lay people off. I know that we're behind schedule on maintenance and repairs in general, so um, I'm just you know, hoping that the Navy will do a good job of spreading some work around to try and ensure that we're not losing skilled workers at a time when we're talking about having Congressman, we have robust conversations with all the shipyards, uh, small, medium, and large across the nation. I personally have visited many of them, Mayor Allen, Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Uh, we would obviously try to keep them as full as possible, but our primary role is to keep ships, ships out at sea and to keep them operational. Obviously, we need to maintain them on time when we have delays and how we maintain the ships because of extended operational periods that are driven by real life circumstances. That creates problems, obviously. Has anyone from, uh, from like Atlantic Ship Repair notified the Navy that they might lay off members of their workforce in the near term future? I, I'd have to get back to you, uh, Congressman. We'd be happy to report back to your staff on recent conversations in regards to the layoff there. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Navy was the only service last year that failed to meet its recruit quality benchmarks and continues to fail to meet them again this year. FY 2024, for the first half of the fiscal year, the Navy is 35% short of its recruitment goal. And in FY 23, was 20% short of recruitment goals. Secretary Del Toro, why do you think the Navy has had so much more trouble hitting its recruiting goals than the Army or the Air Force? I don't like the Navy losing to the Army or the Air Force in anything, but especially when it comes to recruitment. Why are we struggling so much more than the other branches? Well, first and foremost, Congressman, thank you for your question. I'm concerned about recruiting for all our military services. It's one team, one fight. Having said that, the Navy wasn't the only service last year to meet to fall short on its recruiting goals. You fell much further short than the other branches. Uh, we, last year, we began the year at 17,500, thinking we were going to short, fall, fall short by 17,500. We were short by 7,500. This year, we started uh, thinking that we would fall short by 16,400, and it looks like we're going to fall short maybe by 6,200. But what we haven't done is what we have done, actually, is we've increased the goal. So we've actually increased the goal by 7,000 to 40,000 that we need to make up for the shortages of past years. So it's kind of a false narrative is what it is. We're striving to meet the new higher 40,000 goal that we have actually established for, its, uh, for ourselves. You're, set, so that you're we setting a goal and you're not meeting it, and the other branches are coming closer to reaching their goals. What, what are we learning from the Army and the Air Force that the Navy This needs isn't to a numbers game, Congressman. I mean, we hired, we raised the goal game. to 40,000. Secretary, you're turning it into a numbers game. 
Well, but you're the one who brought this up. I mean, if the other services lowered their goals and so met I take, their goals, I take it, I take it and we hired our goals justified. and we're striving to meet our goals, I think that's an admirable uh, challenge, right? So it's admirable we're trying to make up, Well, yes, we're trying to make up for the shortages that we had in previous years because it's all about filling billets at sea is what it's all about. And that's I, what we're striving I, I, to do. I would love to have a Secretary of the Navy come before us and talk about how you're disappointed that you're not reaching your goals and what you're going to do to reach them. So let me ask I think you, you. I think you misunderstood Secretary, what I said. Secretary, let me ask you a different way. What no, you, but I think it's important for me to go on the record Secretary, and say you misunderstood what are you, what are you what doing said. to meet your goals? I said we raised meeting. our recruiting goals to 40,000. Answer my question. And we're what striving are you to doing? Meet please answer my question. What okay. are you doing to meet your goals that you're not doing? What are you going to do to meet those goals? That you're well, we've actually doing? filled all, we're about to fill all our recruiting billets, for example. We're taking a lot of lessons learned from the Marine Corps, for example. Uh, we've actually made numerous process changes, actually, to try to get us to a better place. And I'd be happy to have the CNO add additional details to that list. Um, I'll stick with you, Secretary. Okay. You said that fighting climate change is the Navy's, quote, top priority. No, sir, that's Incredible not correct. I said it is one of the Navy's top priorities, not the top priority. Okay. Is it still, is, is it still a top priority? Absolutely, it's still a top priority. Where does, where does recruitment fall into your priority list? Is it above Recruitment is also a top priority change? as well, too. I have numerous top priorities in the Department of the Navy that I have to worry about on any given day. So you, you, what about uh, delays in shipbuilding? Is that more of a priority than uh, climate change or less? Actually, less we've made priority? significant changes in delays in, in maintenance days at uh, shipyards to actually try to get these ships out of the shipyards quicker. Secretary, you, you don't seem to be too concerned about recruitment, which is really bad. I am significantly but, uh, concerned about recruiting. We've just, actually made a huge difference. Uh, I just told you that we started the year short. off at 16,400. Secretary, are you worried, are you worried that, the, that the Navy shrinking by another 5,000 sailors can make it harder to deter communist China? Are you worried about that? Actually, we're, I just told you we're trying to increase our goal to 40,000 to recruit to that so that we have more sailors to close the gaps at sea so that we can be even more combat ready. All right. I've got one minute left. What are you going to do to meet the Navy's recruitment goals in FY 2024? It's all hands on deck with all the processes and everything that we've put in place to actually shorten what, that goal. And we're actually 2,500 ahead. We are actually 2,500 ahead than where we were last year. So I hope that we get to meet our goals. Are you, go are you going goals. to meet your goal? In FY We're doing everything we can. I don't have a what, crystal what ball. What is everything that you can? What does that mean? What are you doing? That means that I'm putting all our resources, that we have made dramatic improvements in how we recruit. We've taken lessons from the Marine Corps as well, too, to meet our what goals. What are those lessons? And we are actually I, doing 2,500 what, what better have you this year than we were last year. So what we have six doing? months left in the calendar year, basically, to get to the fiscal year, more or less. And we will continue to actually decrease that gap until we get close. You haven't but it's all hands on deck is what it is. You haven't given me a single concrete answer to how you're going to meet those recruits. I think I've given you many concrete answers. A lot of, lot of hot air. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Well, we'd be happy to work with your staff to provide you even more answers, Congressman. Gentlemen, me, gentlemen yields. The chair now recognizes Mr. Carbajal from California. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. General Smith, uh, welcome back. The GAO report from September 2023 highlighted there are major concerns with our military barracks. Some of these service members reported that the conditions of barracks affect their quality of life and readiness. Your number one unfunded priority was $230 million for restoration and modernization of barracks for the Barrack 2030 initiative. While the fiscal year 25 budget request only appears to be for 65 million, I'm sure we both agree that our service members are our number one priority and our most valuable asset. With barracks being such an issue, can you help me understand why your budget request did not include the 230 million for restoration and modernization um, in your unfunded priority list? Congressman, I can. Uh, barracks 2030 is our most consequential barracks investment. Um, we're, we're tackling it from multiple avenues. We're attacking it from professional management, which returns 500 Marines to the fleet, uh, FISRM, facility sustainment, restoration, and modernization funds, maximizing those. That's to fix washers, dryers, locks, windows. Um, we're doing materiel, furniture, um, again, washers, locks. And I've directed a rigorous inspection of over 58,000 rooms. Um, we've completed that inspection, and we now know what is, 
what needs to be fixed. And that's why my number one unfunded priority request is the almost $450 million to accelerate Barracks 2030. Thank you. General Smith, the reduction in maritime prepositioning ships underway has significantly reduced the Marine Corps' flexibility for crisis response operations in the Indo-Pacific, Mediterranean, and elsewhere. Today, only two squadrons of maritime prepositioning ships are available to support Marine Corps global commitments. How are the Marines compensating for this reduction, and how much risk are we accepting strategically? Well, Congressman, I would argue that we're accepting a significant risk strategically. Um, those M MIPSRONs, M Maritime Prepositioning Squadrons, are, are, are ready base. They're designed to flow forward and offload their cargo to, to complete uh, such tasks as the Korea plan, and uh, they would be used um, as, a, uh, as a ready reserve, if you will, of, of assets. So I would uh, offer that that's a real risk when you don't have the MIPSRONs available to replace the um, equipment that will be in inevitably lost in combat and to speed the, the marrying up of Marines who deploy by aviation assets and then the seaborne assets that are on those MIPSRONs. Thank you. Admiral Frichetti, uh, congratulations on your finally being appointed as the 33rd Chief of Naval Operations. I, I apologize for you on, for the Tuverville sec national security breach we, our country went through in delaying your appointment. And I know we have many aspiring senators in this committee. I sure hope they understand the breach that was created by not allowing many of our appointments to move forward. Admiral, can you speak to the Navy Sea Lift campaign plan, specifically how the Buy Use program will work with sea lift preposition and surge assets? Thank you, and you know, sea lift is critically important, one of our core functions of the Navy, and we're really taking a, a three-pronged approach uh, to sea lift. First, we are doing service life extensions on our existing platforms, and then the buy used uh, program that you mentioned. Uh, this has been very productive, and speaking with Transcom and, uh, and Merritt on these conversations, this is a, a very good program. Uh, we've already bought a number of ships, and we are projected to uh, buy up to nine, uh, which is our limit. So uh, we have a legislative proposal in there to uh, remove that limit so we can continue to do that. We're also uh, in the process of designing a, a new sea lift ship. And so, again, working with all stakeholders to make sure that we have that capacity that we need going forward. Thank you, Admiral. And uh, I'm out of time, so um, Secretary Del Toro, thank you for being here. Thank you for articulating the good answers to the bad questions that sometimes you receive. Thank you very much for your service. Ms. Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz from Florida. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Secretary Del Toro and uh, General Smith, if we could just talk very quickly about the Abbey Gate families uh, from the disgraceful Afghanistan withdrawal. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I sent you a letter requesting that the 11 Marines killed at Abbey Gate during the, the withdrawal be posthumously promoted uh, in accordance with 10 U.S. Code Section 1563. It authorizes member of, members of Congress to initiate a recommendation for an honorary promotion. And I'm, I'm grateful that less than two weeks after the bombing, you posthumously promoted Navy Corpsman Soviak to hospital corpsman third class, but it's been nearly three years since these brave Marines were killed and more than six months since I made this request to you. When can we do what's right and promote these Marines? Congressman, this is um, a very sensitive issue, obviously. Um, the corpsman was promoted largely because she had already was under consideration for promotion. Um, I asked my staff to take a look at Medal of Honor recipients who received their Medal of Honor posthumously since the beginning of the Vietnam War. We've had over 50 Marines that courageously lost their lives in battle um, and received the Medal of Honor. Um, none of them Mr. were promoted posthumously. I have posthumously. limited time. We have huge issues. I get five of, minutes on behalf of my... None of them were promoted yeah. posthumously. So, can so we, if, when are we going to promote... Or can you give me an answer of why you're not going to promote these 11 Marines? It's been three years. It's, it's under consideration, but it's very unlikely that they will be promoted. 
it's very unlikely? Yes, sir, because they were not under consideration at the time for promotion. Um, so given the fact that we haven't uh, posthumously promoted 50 Medal of Honor recipients since the beginning of Vietnam, it's Were they killed unlikely. in action, all 50? Excuse me? Were they killed in action, all 50? Yes, sir, they were killed in action, all um, 50. There are as a number, we'll come back to you within, as I stated in the letter, there's a number of instances where, where soldiers, sailors, Marines were not under consideration for promotion, including some that I lost in action, and yet they were promoted because their service secretary decided it was the right thing to do. You have that authority. I have the authority, and I'd be happy to conduct further But you're making a decision you to not execute that authority. Uh, well, like I said, to, uh, Congressman, there have been 50 Medal of Honor recipients that were not That's, promoted posthumously. God bless them. But in this case... And one has to take a look at that as precedence, basically, for actions moving forward. Uh, Mr. Secretary, that's... If that's your decision, that's certainly, but I want out, also out there for the record that you have the authority to promote those Marines. General, should those Marines get promoted? Congressman, as a rule, we, we do not uh, grant posthumous promotions. Um, that does not take away from the sacrifices of those Marines killed at Abbey Gate. But even our posthumous Medal of Honor recipients have not been posthumously promoted. I don't think the level of award general necessarily should dictate whether you give a posthumous promotion. You look at, I mean, this was the worst withdrawal since Saigon. These Marines were put in an impossible position, defend an airfield, yet let people through by the hundreds, if not thousands. I mean, they were put in an impossible position. So we also have to look at the mission, not just historic precedent. And Mr. Secretary, and I would think with your recommendation, General, you have the authority to do it. I'd ask you to reconsider. Uh, and, and let's at least give these families that closure, given the entire nature of what happened in that withdrawal and that they were put in Mission Impossible, not by either of you, but by the White House. But thank you. If we could just talk about, number one, Mr. Secretary, I told you, we're going to recognize the bravery, and I want it loud and clear, of those sailors in the Red Sea. Uh, they're kicking ass and taking names, uh, and, and, and we should absolutely pound the table and please thank I'll you, be Carter. there in Jacksonville when they come back to Mayport God bless the Carney thank you Carter. but if we uh, we ate up my time here but we have the Columbia the Virginia the Constellation our DDGs are all behind we have a broader systemic problem here and it's and I, I know it's an all of society I have a maritime strategy that I'm releasing next week issue uh, to get it workforce, to get it shipyards and steel and materials and all that. And I look forward to working with the legislative recommendations in it. But I think we have a systemic problem in the Navy as well. Can you speak to that in the time I have remaining? Well, the major reasons for the delays on most of these ships is actually delays associated with the delivery of major components from the vendors, particularly Northrop Grumman with regards to turbine generators and main reduction gears, to their primary vendors. That is the root cause of the major delays associated with each of these, with the exception of the, of the, um, of the Fink and Terry. The, the gentleman's um, time has expired. We're running out of time, the, Mr. Secretary, of 2027. The gentleman's we time has expired. The chair now thank recognizes you, Ms. Thank Jacobs you, Madam chair. from California. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you so much uh, to our witnesses. As the representative from San Diego, um, both of these services are incredibly important uh, to my community, uh, and so I'm grateful for you all being here. I first wanted to ask about the USS Boxer. I know my colleague, uh, Mr. Kelly, already asked uh, uh, some of it, um, but you know, what, what I, one of the things I was interested in is just before uh, its deployment in March. It was reported that the ship won several awards, including the Battle Effectiveness Award. Um, I guess I, I'm a little concerned that that shows that we don't actually have a good way to measure the readiness of our ships. Um, and, you know, that we're awarding ships for mission readiness that clearly are not mission ready. Um, how do we, how, how do you assess readiness and how do we make sure it's accurate given these recent developments? Whichever of you would like to answer. Uh, thank you for your question and thank you for your support to our folks in San Diego. You know, in the, in the boxer casualty 
equipment casualty that you're having right now. This is a materiel failure. So, you know, we have a very good set of standards for uh, all of our ships in each one of their primary warfare areas and including engineering and uh, all of the different things that they need to be able to do. They're assessed by an afloat training group and then as a ship progresses from individual training to intermediate and advanced training, we have standards that each one of the ships is supposed to met with very rigid criteria and very well qualified uh, inspectors. So then why was the Boxer awarded this readiness award when they were clearly not ready? So the particular casualty was a documented casualty. It had an engineering assessment for some uh, not related uh, departures from specifications on the rudder, but they this current casualty is a new casualty that was not part of those departures from specifications. Got it. Okay, thanks. Um, and then in terms of the, the sailors who are on the Boxer, um, are they going to stay on the ship through the duration of the maintenance? Um, and will the current maintenance period add time to their deployment schedule? So the Pacific Fleet Commander is the one who will make all the decisions about, about the Boxer. In fact, he is one that approved the uh, maintenance repair plan right now, the way that the current plan is. Um, you know, we, we're optimistic that the repair will be done in about four to six weeks. He has several other branch uh, courses of action if this one doesn't work. Uh, the intention, if it finishes on time, is to get the ship back out on its deployment. Um, because we are, you know, a teammate with the Marine Corps, uh, the Marine Corps also has a deployment, you know, when their deployment ends. So we'll end that deployment on time uh, after the boxer gets out there. Great. Thank you. And then um, uh, I wanted to ask, um, you know, the, the Navy's made tremendous strides in experimental and, and, and research regarding uncrewed systems um, and the digital tools necessary to enable their capabilities. I myself have been out to Bahrain to see some of the, the amazing work we do on that in San Diego. We've got some examples. Um, but I guess one of the things I'm wondering is, is why, given all of that research, we haven't procured those systems in sufficient bulk for the fleet, even though we've identified them as a high priority, and why it's dependent on an OSD program, the Replicator Initiative, to fund and procure these systems, um, rather than going through the actual naval procurement process. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, first and foremost, we have been buying some of those unmanned vessels and the numbers that we currently need to be able to experiment with them. As we continue to further operationalize them, so for example, in Task Force 59, we, you know, we had a set number of cell drones that we purchased from the cell drone company. When we actually moved that to Fourth Fleet and conducting operations uh, in the straits between Haiti and Cuba, uh, taking a look at drug runners, for example, we bought additional cell drones as well, too, so we're purchasing them in the numbers that we currently need them. In the case of operationalizing them in the Pacific, we have four of them that we've been experimenting now with a good part of a year. The, but I think what you will see in the next few years is actually more of those coming to fruition as we continue to bring more of them to work side by side our manned vessels as we operationalize them in the Indo-Pacific as well. So I think you'll see a significant growth in the numbers. Uh, the XLUUV is a perfect example of that. ORCA is in the final stages of, um, of testing for its IOC, for example. We'll have additional four of those once they're fully manufactured and deployed out to sea. Great, thank you. Well, I, you know, I just want to make sure that this approach outlives the current senior leadership at the Pentagon. We've seen great programs fail when leadership changes. Um, and that given the recent uh, issues that have come up with the Air Force and the F-35, that we make sure that the Navy has control over the architecture and software of these kinds of programs. Jen Lee's time expired. Thank you. You're not recognized Jen Lee from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Secretary Del Toro Admiral Franchetti and General Smith for being with us here today. My constituents have a great appreciation of the importance of the U.S. Navy and our Marine Corps. In the low country of South Carolina, we make Marines, and we're really proud of that. Uh, Beaufort County is home to the Paris to Paris Island and the Marine Corps uh, Air Station Beaufort. Our community is deeply supportive of the, the important work being done to train the next generation of Marines and to defend the homeland. I would like to use my time today to highlight the importance of these installations and their capacity to play an even greater role in our national defense. Um, 
the Marine Corps Air Station Buford has the support of a local community. It has excess capacity and room to grow. The number of squadrons has shrunk from, shrunk from nine to five, while the infrastructure to support a larger number of squadrons remains. From my understanding, Marine Corps Air Station Buford's location also provides among the largest training areas anywhere on the eastern seaboard. So, General, my first question for you this morning is, is do we have plans to expand the mission set or number of squadrons stationed there? Congresswoman, we don't have plans right now to expand the number of squadrons there, but we will modify the number of aircraft, and those, those aircraft will increase squadron sizes from 10 to 12. And then what's the timing uh, of that implementation? Um, I'll get back to you on that, Congresswoman, to give you the exact details and dates. Okay, my understanding is it starts in a few months' delivery of some of the, the newer cra aircraft on that installation. Uh, currently, Paris Island lacks the um, on-base medical facilities, personnel, and capabilities required to efficiently treat recruits who are injured in training. Um, under the current model, the Naval Hospital in Beaufort provides uh, only ambulatory care, and so many of the recruits are required to secure outside treatment, and we know that if their treatment uh, is prolonged and off the installation, they're more apt to maybe not return back to training and we wanna make sure that they get the immediate care that they need. Um, would building an on-base multi-purpose medical facility at Paris Island in a smaller clinic at Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort help our Marines get appropriate medical care? What is your sort of sense of medical care for our Marine recruits in their training? Well, Congresswoman, I'm committed to making sure that all of our recruits, East Coast and West Coast, have adequate medical care. Um, and I defer to our Surgeon General, uh, Navy Surgeon General, on the allocation of resources and medical providers to, to ensure that our recruits have what they need. Mm -hmm. um, because right now, there, there is a lack of, um, of medical readiness at Paris Island, and I acknowledge that. And some of it are, you know, some of it might be related to chronic staffing shortages, like at the Naval Hospital. Have you all had discussions about that and been aware of maybe some of the high turnover as well? Congresswoman, we have. I speak with Admiral Miller, who's the uh, Surgeon General for the Marine Corps, on a, literally right now, almost on a daily basis. Is there, are there plans to increase recruitment of um, medical personnel to, to treat our service members at this time? Uh, Ma'am, I'll defer to the Navy on, on recruiting Navy personnel. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. So Marine Corps, I have a minute and a half left. Marine Corps Air Station in Beaufort is experiencing a housing, housing crisis. Uh, we have a military population of around 12,000 in Beaufort County. There are only 1,140 units, housing units at Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort and approximately 960 of those units are occupied with the less, the rest being unlivable or in disrepair. I'm sure you're well aware about these units. Uh, they were built in the 1960s. They have not experienced significant upgrades or increased volume since construction. So obviously this is an issue that I hear about day in and day out from folks um, in the Low Country and in Beaufort. What are we doing to ensure our Marines and their families uh, in Beaufort have access to safe, quality, and affordable housing while they're stationed there? Well, ma'am, the, the on-base housing is in need of refurbishment. That, mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. Um, our budget calls for uh, an update in our FISRM, which is our, our barracks, um, Facility Sustainment Restoration and Modernization, and it calls for um, ensuring that there's enough quality housing on base to, to satisfy the needs, which right now it's not. So uh, the increased budget will assist us in, in improving the housing that is there, and then others will live out in town based on cost of living allowance. Okay, and is there any uh, movement afoot to look at the contractors and who we're using down there to improve the quality of construction and maintenance? Yes, ma'am, there okay. is. Okay, cool. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I think the gentlelady, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Moulton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Smith, the Marine Corps has attracted a fair number of critics for the speed of your modernization, uh, including even some from, uh, from our own ranks, retired generals and whatnot. Why is the Marine Corps moving faster with modernization than the other services? Well, Congressman, uh, there's a couple reasons. Uh, one, we have a commandant. Um, and when the commandant says move, Marines move. Um, but it's not just based on my assessment. It's based on a deep um, research 
deep war gaming, deep analysis, and consent compliance with the national defense strategy. So our modernization efforts under, under the name of force design are designed to make us the most lethal and most ready for the fight that's coming, not for the fight that we just had. Well, some uh, members of Congress got together and wrote an, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal some months ago when this debate was at its height. And uh, it was extremely supportive, of course, of what you're, what you're trying to do. Um, but we did have one criticism. We had one criticism in the whole article. We said, if anything, the Marine Corps should be moving faster. Now, your, your plan is to maintain momentum. That's the title of your, of, of your current plan. But the chairman of the Joint Chiefs says we need to accelerate change or lose. What can the Marine Corps do to move even faster with modernization, and what can Congress do to help? Congressman, the, the steady, reliable funding um, is, is really important. Uh, frankly, um, when we go into... Uh, and this is not to criticize, but when we go into um, uh, resolution. uh, continuing resolutions, thank you, Mr. Secretary, um, when we go into continuing resolutions, we cannot spend at that year's rate. We have to spend at last year's rate. And, and our, all of our advancements are in the current year. So it, it retards our, pro our process, and it retards our, pro our progress, and it slows us down. Well, I would just say that if there are any more specific things that you can come to us and say, uh, you know, if we do this, we can move even faster. We can get rid of the old stuff more quickly. We can invest in the new things and field them to the troops even more quickly than we are today. There's going to be a lot of receptivity for that on this, uh, on this committee. Um, Admiral Franchetti, a lot of my colleagues talk about a 355 ship Navy. Do you think that's a reasonable goal? I do. I think every study, really, that we've done since 2016 shows that we do need a larger Navy. And, uh, you know, we're committed, as we said, in, through all of our investments in the industrial base. But it isn't just about the numbers. It is about having ready ships with the munitions, with the right number of people, with the training, you know, that can fight as part of that joint warfighting ecosystem that we need to be able to do in the high-end fight. I've heard nothing but good things about you, so it's not really fair to have my first question to you be a bit of a trick question. But I'm very concerned about a 355-ship Navy because I think we should probably add a zero to that or maybe two zeros. Because if we don't have a Navy that has literally thousands of autonomous ships, I don't know that we're going to win the, the future fight. Yep, I'm, I'm very focused on uh, increasing our abilities in the unmanned space. You know, I think that as you look forward, we really need to have that complementary force that will be able to expand the reach and the lethality of our conventionally manned platforms. That's what we need to do in the future, and I'm committed to focusing on that, I growing that as quickly as possible. General Smith, one core component of your strategy with Marine littoral regiments is being able to put these Marines on places like islands in the Philippines. Um, so they're, they're spread out, they're dispersed, they're autonomous, uh, they, can, uh, they can do a lot to disrupt uh, Chinese plans. But of course that's dependent on having these agreements with nations like the Philippines, perhaps Japan as well. What are you doing to foster those agreements and actually get Marines practicing uh, what you preach? Congressman, we're exercising with our Filipino allies on a, on a regular basis. We just finished Balakatan, the largest one ever, uh, involving thousands of Marines. And so our ability to exercise throughout the southern Ryukus, the Japanese uh, home islands, and the Philippines is with, without question. Uh, we have um, um, a very hospitable host in the Philippines. Uh, finally, Mr. Secretary, you know how important uh, mental health of our service members is uh, to me personally, and having worked with a fellow veteran to, uh, to pass uh, 988, um, can you just tell me, uh, at, at, at this point, is 988 dialable from, without a prefix, without a postfix, from all unclassified DOD telephone systems in the Navy and the Marine Corps? I, Congressman, I can't confirm that it's dialable for every single one, but I w what I will tell you is that the marketing campaign that we put into effect to actually have the uh, 988 posters throughout every installation uh, is extraordinary. And, Gentlemen's and time's expired. Chair, I have visited the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. Kickens. Thank you.
Thank you to our panel for being here. It's certainly a privilege to be in the same room as, as the three of you. We've done a lot of talking today about the number of ships and, and how this, this fiscal year 25 budget takes us down to 287, decommissioning ships prior to their expected service life, decommissioning more than we're commissioning, slowing the aircraft carrier build, you know, having the sub, having the submarine uh, build. So I'm just worried about the you know that message that's sending to our allies. We, we've got this great AUKUS agreement in place. We're excited about it. Uh, also to our shipbuilding partners. We talked today about the number of ship repair, and I've got them in my district in Virginia, too, that that message that that sends to them, they can't keep their people. I know continuing resolutions is part of it. It's frustrating to me, too. Uh, and I know the defense budget is always inadequate. But but what are we doing or what can we do to be more reassuring to partners like allies like Australia or people we need in the fight like our ship repair and shipbuilding industry? Thank you, Congresswoman. I think the biggest thing we can do is actually reaffirm the commitment uh, just in this fit up alone that we're investing $18 billion in the submarine industrial base to actually try to increase the production rates to where they need to be so that we could actually build more submarines in, well into the future. Along those same lines, just talking about messaging and uh, getting our message to our, our partners like allies and, and ship prepared ship builders. Uh, for the recruitment retention side, I know we've talked about that today too, and I had the privilege of sitting on the Recruitment Retention Quality of Life Task Force. I hope you all have copies of, of the bound book that we put together. Uh, and my ask yesterday to the Secretary of Defense was just to get that word out to the American public. I need them to know that Congress hears them, that we've emphasized things like pay and compensation, housing, child care, health care, spouse employment. I need that message to get to them. So through that's a PR campaign or uh, and Kudos to the buildsubmarines.com. I've had multiple people in my district come up to me and say, hey, we, we've reached out to, we, we saw the ad. So, so I think those things work. So let's get that message out to the American people that we heard them and we're taking care of our military men and women. 9,000 new applications just this past year, ma'am. Awesome. And, and retention is as high as it's ever been in the Navy and the Marine Corps, well, thanks to your investments in quality of life, quality service. We need to keep, keep down that track. I want to switch gears to naval aviation, subject near and dear to my heart as a former Navy pilot. but. Uh, you know, I look at programs like the A-12, like the F-22, and, and we can we can ask a lot of questions about if we should have done some things differently. I'm looking at the F-35 right now, and yesterday we talked a lot about that expense and how it continues to grow. We have quite a few that are still sitting on flight lines. They're not, uh, we don't have pilots in cockpits yet. Uh, I want to put in my plug for Naval Air Station Oceana in my district, and how. And I know, Secretary, we've had discussions too about considering them uh, East Coast Master Jet Base so that we can can house the F-35s. I know the city of Virginia Beach is very welcoming to the idea, and, and I look forward to pursuing further discussions about that. Uh, along those same lines, though, thinking of naval aviation training, uh, and again, my, my son is now in Corpus Christi, very proud of him, uh, started the pipeline, but that wait, the wait for those students is too long. We've invested in them uh, from Cessna training. They're sitting, they're waiting for starting primary, but now we're looking at the T-45s. I know we had recent compressor stall issues. Uh, this is the second time that we are now halting you know, training in the T-45. So I need the Navy to have some foresight and to think about what that replacement aircraft looks like for advanced jet training, because this isn't our first go around with this. We have options out there. So I want to hear from you all. What is the timeline for replacing that T-45? So, ma'am, as you know, we're actually several years from replacing the T-45, but we're accelerating uh, the necessary work uh, to actually try to move that to the left so that we can actually get the next generation of trainers out there and have it be uh, reliable. It can't happen fast enough because when, when those guys are yes, delayed, then I got the, the Hornet Ragged Oceana delayed and I got yes, fleet pilots that are that are then being held up. So, so as much as we can expedite that. Uh, and then I also just wanted to close with a story. I w had the privilege of traveling to Israel about three weeks ago, meeting with military intelligence officers, dining with just everyday Israelis and families, uh, and listening to them thank me as the representative uh, from Hampton Roads, thanking, thanking me and all of us for sending our aircraft carriers, the, the Ford, the Eisenhower, the Bataan, over to sit off the coast of Israel in our quick response after October 7th. They truly believe, each and every Israeli I spoke to, that because of our aircraft carrier presence, that is why Hezbollah did not invade Israel from the north. I had Israeli families dining with their children, skipping around the room, saying, I want to go on the aircraft carrier. I want to go on the aircraft carrier. So, so I was the representative that received phone calls when we extended those deployments, when they missed Christmas with their families, when they missed the birth of their first child. But because of those servicemen and when, because of our U.S. Navy, you know, we, we maintain some stability and some peace in that region. I've shared that story with the ship repair, shipbuilders, with Navy leadership, but please take that story back to your men and women. We, we know it's a sacrifice, but we appreciate their sacrifice, and that's what keeps the peace in the world. So thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you. I yield back. I think the gentleman here and I recognize there's another uh, lady from uh, Hawaii, Takuda, Mr. Takuda. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your continued personal attention to Red Hill and the significant work the department is doing to get things right after the November 2021 fuel spill. As the Navy assumes responsibility for the closure of Red Hill, I respectfully request your focus as well on the necessary work to remediate and restore the aquifer and ensure the long-term safety of our water supply. There's a lot of concern among our communities and constituents that our department continues to view the Red Hill problem set in sequential order, moving from defueling to closure to remediation when elements of closure and remediation can and should be done concurrently. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in the interest of time, I won't ask you to respond, but would strongly encourage the department to urgently prioritize aquifer restoration and remediation efforts for Red Hill. Um, I will go on to say, though, that there continues to be gaps in community trust, and this is a broken trust, as we know, in the department's ability to guarantee the health and safety of their drinking water, especially given the uncertainty created by the Navy's testing regime. The Navy recently released its data supporting the hypothesis that low-level detections of TPH at the Pearl Harbor drinking water system were likely caused by issues with its testing methods. Mr. Secretary, would you um, please explain why would the Navy use testing for wastewater and solid waste analysis? analysis for drinking water and why did it take two years and over 8,000 samples to figure out that they were not doing the right test? Well, well ma'am, the conclusions that were made with regards to the testing procedures was a combined conclusion with the President of, of the Health Department of Hawaii, uh, the EPA and the Navy and collectively they determined that chlorine was actually impacting the actual test results with regards to I, the I think it's the first step to the question. Of so TPH. did the Department of Health and EPA tell you two years ago to use a test on these 8,000 samples that were made for wastewater and solid waste analysis, not drinking water? Uh, Ma'am, the tests that were used at the time were the, te the only tests that were actually available at the time to be able to use. And they were actually off the, the off, out of, they were on the mainland, basically, so we had to actually send all, all those tests back to the mainland. And actually, just yesterday, I signed a letter to the governor actually saying that we're donating the necessary equipment for Hawaii to actually have its own water testing laboratory in Hawaii. That's great. So you're telling me two years ago when we were suffering from a situation where there was no trust in the drinking water because jet fuel had been poured into it, we were using the only test available. So there was no te test available for drinking water. We were using a test on these samples to determine if there was any kind of contaminants in people's home that was for wastewater and solid waste analysis. That was the only one available to you. Ma'am, I am not the subject matter expert on this, but I will say that we were using the test that was recommended to the Department of the Navy and to the Department of Hawaii Health Resources and to the EPA to test those water samples at the time. So would you now say, based upon your Because if we, had, if we had known of some better test, we would have actually been using that test. At the but time, I don't think we understood that the chlorine in the water that's used to actually chlorinate all the water across the United States, which actually have an impact on TPH uh, detections I'm in sorry, the test itself. If I may just continue my question, I find it also hard to believe that we have the best minds in science and defense sitting in the Navy, also sitting in the EPA, part of our Department of Health, and they were unable to determine or identify that two years ago when they started these samplings because your men and women and their families were seeing sheens in their drinking water experiencing massive health impacts that maybe something wasn't right there in that particular thing. So I just ask you this hypothetical question. I'll flip the switch on you a little bit. I'm assuming that suppliers of ammunition to DOD are required to do regular testing to ensure functionality and lethality. What if a series of their tests found flaws? And then they later came back and said they've been testing the ammo in the wrong way for two years and now everything is okay. Would you trust putting ammo in a soldier's gun knowing it could be the difference between life and death? Ma'am, I'm not a subject matter expert on testing fresh water. Uh, well, I'm testing thinking you would want to make sure that the bullets in a soldier's gun actually works. It should be no different when the quality of the water is coming out of a service member and their family's I'm, water pipe. I'm you quite have confident. to do much more in terms of rebuilding this trust. And I will tell you that that was a big lethal blow well, to the trust of the Navy a few weeks ago when the public got this kind of response. I'm running out of time here, but given these recent events, will the Navy consent to independent third-party testing to help track and verify the Navy's testing? I believe we have had third water testing uh, going on. So you'd on allow on people to come in and drill occasions. holes, collect samples, and do their own independent testing. Those, those are decisions that have to be made between the Department of the Navy 
and the Department of Health in Hawaii and so the EPA So you're giving EPA consent forward. that third-party independent drilling and testing can take place so that it can be verified and I re-verified. believe we have had third-party testing in the past. Okay. That is not the understanding I have, but I'm glad to hear that we have the consent of the Secretary to go ahead and allow them to I start said that we My have had... My time is up. time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Mr. Secretary, I want to personally thank you for your involvement in Naval Air Station Pensacola to unlock the great potential of our Naval Museum with some changes to the gating system there. This was a sticky wicket for us for years and because you took the time to go there and really understand that mission, we were able to achieve greater success. And I think it's because you get it. I think you understand that um, unlocking the imagination in the minds of young people when they interact with our museums and with our uh, demonstration teams, that's a critical vector in the recruiting crisis that we're all dealing with. So I'd, I'd love you to share your perspective on that with the committee. Uh, no, thank you, Congressman. I always try my very best to get to the core problems that we face and try to fix those problems so we can make our Navy and Marine Corps a stronger team and actually trying to gain greater access to all of our museums, but particularly that museum, uh, which is so very special to the, the community, the aviation community, and to the entire Department of the Navy is critical so that young people, high school graduates, community college graduates, grammar school uh, students can actually go and see what the Navy is all about uh, is important. And I'm glad that we've been able to make progress in actually opening up the museum to a greater number of people in the region. And I, I must confess, you may become a victim of your own success here, uh, because uh, I have a similar problem that I think you'll see in a similar way. The Blue Angels, as they travel around the country and travel around the world, they, they ignite a sense of optimism about the Navy and adventure. And we are so proud in Pensacola to be the home of the Blue Angels, but some of the conditions of our hangar systems have fallen into some disrepair following Hurricane Sally. And so we're working right now with your office to try to get the right, uh, the right alignment of PD&E funds to get a new hangar system for the Blue Angels. But I wanted to make sure that you saw the Blue Angels similarly, like you saw the, Naval, the, the museum promoting all that is good and right uh, in the Navy uh, to get more young people excited about it. Is that something we can work on? Absolutely, Congressman. I think the CNO would agree that the Blue Angels brings tremendous value to our recruiting mission. Yes, great. And, you know, we want to just make sure, you know, that they've got the right digs. I think, uh, Admiral, I'd invite you to come down and spend some time with us in Pensacola, as the Secretary has, the cradle of na naval aviation. But you, you would likely walk away from that experience deeply concerned that there are buckets that are having to collect rainfall, which we occasionally get in Florida, inside the hangar system, not outside. And so uh, I would encourage you to, to come join us because we certainly would want our greatest, uh, our greatest demonstration of naval capability uh, to be able to have the right accommodations to be able to do the mission. Thanks, I look forward to coming down and visiting. Yeah, well see, and I'm inviting you to a beautiful place. You know, not all the people on this committee are from beautiful places, <laughs> like Northwest Florida. So uh, we, I certainly hope you'll, you'll take us up, uh, up on, that, on that opportunity. Uh, in, in my remaining moments, I want to talk a little bit about the LCS. Uh, the ranking member has sort of convinced me that the littoral combat ship may sadly, tragically, in some circumstances, turn out to be just an aquatic casket in a world in which we are unable to have sufficient air defense for those while China is shooting hypersonic missiles at them in the event of a Taiwan scenario. I mean, is there a fight that we can imagine now in great competition where the LCS will even get in the fight? Mr. Secretary? Uh, very much, Congressman. And actually, we're taking the necessary steps. Right now, we've added uh, the Naval Strike Missile to six of the LCSs, for example. By 26, we, we hope to have them all on the uh, Independence class and, and then on the Freedom class uh, by, by 2032. Actually, I may have those reversed, right? It's, but we plan Will on putting- Will that provide hypersonic air defense? The hypersonics, you won't be able to put it on LCS. Right, so that's my worry. But, 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 but you can put, you actually can fire SM-6 from on mo mobile launchers off the, the decks, and that's something that we've already experimented with and have proven out successfully. So the fact that we could actually be so able it, to fire an SM-6 from an LCS is actually very, very positive. We're doing that now? Yes, yes sir, we've already expanded on and, and we're confident that that would be a sufficient capability to defend against an, an offensive hypersonic system from China? Well, it'll make it that much more defendable, that's for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I hope that's right, but I really worry that we've adopted this theory that just more is better 
on, on some of these platforms. And if, if, if they're not relevant to the fight because they can't get into the fight, um, I worry about how many of them we should buy and how many of them we should build. Uh, did you have a perspective on that, Admiral? I mean, the LCS performs a you know, pretty critical mission for mine countermeasures, you know, and we're moving forward with that package. I think you know, that is a very important mission that we do. A lot of our allies and partners do that too, so being able to integrate that capability is critically important. Again, there's a lot of different uh, scenarios that we might encounter, so having multiple tools in the tool bag is very important. Okay, well, demining is a far more constrained concept than we'd originally had for the LCS. I don't know that it's able to achieve all those goals, but thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman chair, and I recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. McClellan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to follow up on your discussion with my landlock colleague, um, Mr. Banks, about uh, climate change, and I want to talk about the impact that climate change has on readiness, operations, infrastructure, um, our forces, and their families. Uh, naval Station Norfolk is the largest naval insta installation in the world and is located in a city that has the highest rate of sea level rise on the East Coast. Recent projections show that it will face um, one major flood a year and a minor flood every week. Uh, meanwhile, we are seeing record-setting heat waves in the Pacific Northwest. Um, can you discuss how sea level rise, recurring floods, more frequent and destructive hurricanes, record-setting heat waves, um, discuss the impact that they all have and will continue to have on readiness, operations, our naval infrastructure, our service members, and their families? Yes, ma'am. Well, first and foremost, uh, climate uh, installation readiness is combat readiness. Uh, if we can't deploy our, if we can't house our ships safely in, in, in ports, and deploy them safely, then we have a bigger problem, right? And so mitigating, making the investments in order to mitigate the negative effects of climate change are extremely important in all our ports across the entire United States. And we're seeing the dramatic challenges that that brings. And so greater investments in moving the utilities to the right places so that, that they're not negatively impacted by the rising uh, sea levels is incredibly important. How you construct the piers themselves, for example, and where you put the utilities on those piers is extremely important. And so, again, installation readiness is combat readiness. In fact, CNO can comment more so on the operational side as well. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things, <clears throat> you know, that we look for as we're designing our new platforms is making sure um, from an operational readiness perspective that they, um, you know, have the ability to operate wherever they need to be able to operate. And so, again, having the right facilities where we can pull them in uh, is critically important. And corrosion has an impact on metal and an impact on ships and ship readiness as well. And record setting heat waves have an effect on our sailors and our corpsmen, correct? And their ability to do their job and the health and their readiness? Very much so, uh, Congresswoman. It's had an impact on unaccompanied housing as well, too. Look, we, we for decades have made, uh, the Congress has made really impressive investments in family housing, but we haven't invested in unaccompanied housing to the extent that we should. We're correcting that now. We're doing that moving forward, and I think our sailors and Marines appreciate that given the high retention rates that we've seen in the Navy and Marine Corps. But it's still a huge challenge in areas of high humidity. So whether it's Key West, whether it's Paris Island, other places like that, San Diego as well too, you know, these are the places we have to pay even more attention to, quite frankly, to be able to get them up to the standards where they could resist the, uh, the humidity. And to put a finer point on that, uh, increased uh, temperatures and increased flooding and increased moisture leads to increased mold. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, now I want to focus on the readiness of the Navy for a possible conflict in the Indo-Pacific region and discuss our overseas repair capability. Uh, my staff recently traveled to Japan to meet with security partners there who expressed concerns that shipbuilding and repair capabilities are located almost exclusively in the United States and that um, in, in case of a war or a conflict, this would severely restrain our combat capability if we have to send ships all the way back to Hawaii or San Diego for repairs. Um, what is your assessment of this risk, and what are the department and the administration doing to ensure robust repair capabilities are available in the Pacific should a conflict break out? 
Well, thank you, Congressman, for that question. And it is indeed a, a combat-related question. I mean, if we find ourselves in conflict and we suffer damage, which is ine inevitable, uh, we will be able to have to send those ships back to the closest depot necessary to be able to repair those ships. So what we're asking of the Congress this year, basically, is to authorize us up to six continuous maintenance availabilities of less than 90 days so that we can then now go and assess which foreign shipyards will be able to do this work effectively during times of peace. I hope we never have to go to war, but if we should have to go to war, we will then have full knowledge of which shipyards and what countries we could actually send these ships to be able to do the damage repair that's going to be necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. I think the lady, the chair now recognizes a gentleman from Georgia, Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Sorry that I was out of line. I saw Mr. Fallon came in ahead of you. I apologize. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon's recognized. Dr. McCormick denied. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so it's, it's Mr. Secretary, thank you, and, and uh, General Admiral, thank you for being here. The thing that I, 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 get, I come back to, and we had a discussion about this last year, is recruiting prices. So, and, and I apologize because I, I was um, up in my office and missed a, a little bit of this testimony. But, Mr. Secretary, do you believe that the recruiting crisis is an existential threat to the Republic? I think it is across the entire nation. In fact, we need more blue-collar workers. We need more young men and women, actually, who are willing to come into our armed services across the board and serve. No, I think, I, it, it, ironically and oddly, it's refreshing to hear that because if we're not going to solve a problem unless we really understand the, the gravity of it. And, and thank you for that. And so I was looking at the, the statistics and from all branches, but particularly, obviously, we'll talk about the Navy today, that we missed their goals last year by 20%. About seven, about yes, seven sir. We, had a, a, we actually fell short. At the beginning of the year, we thought we'd be at 17,500. We ended the year at 7,500. This year, at the beginning of the year, we thought we'd be short about 16,500. And we'll probably end it perhaps at 6,400 or less. But we actually increased our goal this that, year yeah. to 40,000, which is important to note. You know, we want to make up for the shortages sure. from previous years so we can reduce the number of, of gaps that we have at sea. Yeah, because I think this happens every once in a while, and where it's, but it's an anomaly, and it's just the year, and then the next year, and you can you can mitigate some of it, of course, with retention as well. But what I'm alarmed about is when it's year over year, and it's of course with at least with the Navy, it's going to be two years in a row. With the Army, it's been three years. But of course, the Marine Corps always meets the recruiting goals. They have the best commercials. What are you going to do? <laughs> but uh, yeah, look at the Navy slash Marine guy over here that was. Uh, the Air Force won this one, by the way. But, uh, so what can we do? What new innovative ideas can we use, uh, Mr. Secretary, to mitigate this and, and, and really end it? Because I think that's what we're after here, is if it's been three, yes, three unsuccessful years with the Army and two with the Navy, we need to do something differently. And what, what do you think those things So should be? please understand it's been an all-hands-on-deck okay, effort good, across good, the good. board. And the CNO can talk specifically to some of the measures that we have taken. But it is all-hands-on-deck. And we're actually putting a call out to maritime service across the board as well, too. Thank you. And I agree, recruiting is really an, <clears throat> an existential threat. Um, so we're kind of taking two-pronged approach. One is first to re approve the recruiting enterprise itself. So the Navy just put a two-star admiral in charge of recruiting. Good. Um, we have also adopted a thing that we use in aviation for aviation operations maintenance, understanding what's going on with each type model series. We're looking at, we have a recruiting operations center now to look at what's going on with each one of our recruiting centers, each recruiter, because it's really about throughput per recruiter, and how do we need to improve their ability to recruit. The other thing, as the secretary mentioned, you know, we had taken... 60% uh, manning cut, uh, to man at 60% in our recruiting centers when we put more people at sea. So we actually had reduced our recruiting force. By the end of May, we should have that fully restored. So we'll be able to do that. Well, I think Admiral, on the I, other I, side. I, I, it's all right. I, I don't make it a, a habit to interrupt flag officers. So I apologize for that. But um, I, I really want to emphasize how we need it to be measurable as well. And also a question. When we have excellent recruiters, are they allowed to stay within the recruiting command? Yeah, we have a rec career recruiter force. Okay, good. Yep. Okay. So they, they can do it for, because that's the thing I don't want, is somebody highly successful and then they leave. And I would generally, gently suggest that we build everything around recruiting right now. We make sure that they're manned and then build, that, that should be the first thing. 
again, just right. That's how we get our seed corn. We really need to make those investments. Yeah, and you know, I was thinking about as far as the Navy. You're on all the planes. You're under the water. You're on the water. You're in the air. You're on the ground. You're in space. I don't think any of the brands can say that. And always forward. Yeah, right. But uh, because of that, I would imagine that you would recruit the submarine, a submariner, differently than you're going to attract somebody to, to say go into the. Uh, special ops and seals or somebody to go into cyber or intel or service fleet and uh, i just want to touch on that a little bit and ask you uh what are what field or expertise has been most hit by recruiting the recruiting crisis actually m the medical profession we're, we're having a really hard time in the medical profession and also recruiting in the nuclear field as well too uh, because we just don't have enough students in colleges that actually go into those studies. And so we're, we're having to work at a younger age, in the case of the nukes, actually trying to encourage high schoolers to actually go into the nuclear field. And you know the problems that exist in, in recruiting health professionals sure. across and, the And board. I'd just like to, again, gently ask and politely ask, maybe uh, with the recruiting stuff, a quarterly report given to this committee would be wonderful for us because we, there's a role for us to play as well. And we want to give you the resources to succeed. We just want to measurable and think out of, outside the box because we've got to take care of this. None of us want to go, dare I say, to a draft. And if we're going to- Gentleman's time has expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Thank North you. Carolina, Mr. Davis. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and to the witnesses. Um, good afternoon to you. Mr. Secretary, we spoke last year about expediting toxic water claims um, processing um, for those veterans as a result of the Camp Lejeune um, situation. Uh, Mr. Secretary, what's the estimated timeline now that you would forecast in getting claims um, heard, uh, in particular with the elective option been in place? Yes, sir. It actually depends on how quickly the claimants themselves actually completely fill the paperwork online. We've made tremendous progress and investments because this is very important to the Department of the Navy, to, to the Department of Defense, to the President of the United States, actually. And so we have 190,000 claimants, basically, that have now signed online, but many of them actually haven't completed their full regiment of paperwork necessary to be able to process those claims. But we are moving extremely fast once a claimant actually submits all the necessary documentation, all the necessary uh, paperwork to make them the authors that they so re, uh, deserve. From the time that a completed claim is submitted, uh, what would you estimate? I'd have um, to get back to you specifically on, on the amount of time. We, we could do the analysis on those that have fully submitted their, their paperwork. And I do know that out of the ones that have fully submitted their paperwork, for example, some have actually taken time to consider the, 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 um, the offers that have been made. Um, and so we can provide you all the specific statistics associated with the... Uh, there was a report that was due in January on the 1st. When do you anticipate that report? I'll have to get back to you on where that report is, uh, okay. Congressman. In eastern North Carolina, there's a growing need for employment opportunities that can provide young people with careers. I um, recently facilitated a meeting between representatives from the Newport News Shipyard um, Community Colleges in North Carolina and workforce development officials um, from across our region to collaborate on these opportunities in our part of the state. Um, Mr. Secretary, um, is there a, a pool, I mean, we know there's a pool of existing talent that's going to exit uh, the Navy in particular. Uh, they're separating for whatever reason. Um, how can we better assist in particular um, service members that we know are exiting through the transition assistance program um, in these certain critical areas that are important for our national security still? Well, Congressman, first and foremost, my goal is to keep them in, obviously. Understood. So we're trying our very best, and actually retention has been the highest. It's been historic, actually, for both the Navy and the Marine Corps. So we're doing our job well and providing the necessary quality of life, quality of services necessary to keep them in. But I think you raise an important point, and one of the things that we've been talking about in this call to maritime services, for those individuals that do depart, actually, how could we actually guide them to work in our shipyards, as one example? Um, you know, we have a very robust Naval X program in North Carolina, for example, that helps private industry in North Carolina work with the Department of the Navy. And that's part of that as well, too. Yeah. And Mr. Secretary, obviously, we want to continue to keep them in, um, but obviously there's a point in time where we know the separation is going to occur. And that's yes, what I was really highlighting. You know, when we know it's going to occur, 
Um, now we're a matter of transitioning. So, you know, that's definitely something I think we have to continue to um, think through, in particular our transition assistance programs. Yes, sir. Um, because that still can be the pipeline to securing our national security. So I appreciate yes, that. Sir. Elizabeth City State University is an HBCU in my district, uh, has a growing aviation program, the only four year aviation sciences program in North Carolina um, that's on track to growing and increasing its capacity. Um, they're looking to build additional aviation hubs, in particular at Marine Corps um, Air Station um, Cherry Point, um, been one of the locations. Um, this program could provide a pipeline of pilots um, to the military. So I'm trying to get them in too, not just concerned about the transits, but trying to get them in as well. How can the Navy collaborate and leverage programs like this, universities like Elizabeth City State University and other HBCUs to alleviate pilots, pilot shortages? Well, Congressman, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with Elizabeth State University, but I'm going to be by tonight. <laughs> and my commanding general of Marine Corps Recruiting <laughs> Command is going to be by tomorrow morning. <laughs> And oh God! Is it too? And we'll, <laughs> because we are we are looking for pilots. Um, we are looking for pilots. All right. Well, from this airman to the devil dog, I say, huh. I yield back, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the doctor from Georgia, and this time for real. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate you. Uh, it's interesting uh, when you talked about recruiting just recently. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but a couple things came to mind when when we forgive student debt, for example. And we have people who never went to college paying for people who did go to college who didn't have their debt forgiven. Where's the incentive to give away scholarships for the military when we're recruiting if their college is already paid for for free? Where's the incentive to motivate people to go into medicine or anything else when they don't incur debt otherwise? We have to remember that this is an incentive-driven society and that we are an all-volunteer force. And I think we have to realize that in our recruiting force. Secondly, I think when it comes to our enlisted folks, uh, when we recruit, we always have to go after the warriors, which means we recruit on the right stations, the right places, with the right message. The Sergeant Major of the uh, Army, the former Sergeant Major, still owes me 100 push-ups because I told him he was barking up the wrong tree by, by going after the recruiting uh, venues that they were using. I like the Marines. I, I may be a little biased. I may have been involved in something like that. But when you talk about the few, the proud, the Marines, and it is about a warrior ethos. That's why we make our quota, because we recruit the right people for the right mission, and that's what we should focus on. Uh, with that said, we do have a mission, and it's all over the globe right now. Uh, one of the things that we're having a hard time delivering is our people to the right place at the right time with our amphibious shipping, which we're obviously in a shortfall right now. I know we're trying to reallocate for a mission all over the world, a diverse mission, which I understand we have limited funds for. Um, do you think we're going to be able to fix this? Are we, are we shifting away from this amphibious warfare model, or are we, uh, are we going to reinvest in expanding our amphibious fleet so we can meet the needs of the Corps and the Navy? But, but by no means uh, imaginable, Congressman. We are fully dedicated uh, to a strong and robust amphibious fleet. Uh, just in this budget alone, we have reinserted three LPDs in 25, 27, 29. We actually moved LHA 10 to the left by uh, two years um, and so we're fully committed, and that commitment has to continue well into the future as well, too, with uh, bringing on the, the, the LSMs that the Commandant mentioned earlier as well, too. Uh, our, our Marines need to move around long distances in the Indo-Pacific as well as island to island, and we need to give them the capabilities to do so. Do we think that we're on – what kind of timeline before we start to catch up to that curve that we're obviously behind on right now? We're, we're, we're struggling to meet our needs. I think as long as we, we can remain steady on, uh, on LPD production, for example, uh, we're going to be okay. Uh, the production lines down in, uh, in, in Pascagoula are not as challenged as they are uh, in the submarine community and, and up north as well either. And so they're being able to deliver these ships pretty much on time, on budget, a uh, few months delayed, but not certainly years delayed. Great. Uh, I'm aware that the Marine Corps in fiscal year two, uh, 2024 has uh, uh, requested for to reinstate a couple of 53 kilos, uh, those beautiful, magnificent birds that they are, uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, what, it seems like just two helicopters, what, what kind of impact does that have on the fleet when we talk about two helicopters? Congressman, uh, two helicopters is significant uh, for us. Um, and and to, to answer your question, it's about the CH-53K. 
which is an incredible platform that can lift itself. It can literally lift itself. It is the only heavy lift, true heavy lift helicopter in the DOD inventory, in-flight refuelable, and can lift itself. It can lift 48,000 pounds external, which is stunning. So I'm committed to making sure that our fleet of uh, CH-53Ks is robust and is fully outfitted. Thank you, and, and uh, I love the picture recently of the 53 kilo, uh, kilo with a slung load uh, at 35. <laughs> Aerial refueling nonetheless. Uh, I, I hope to be on the next one of those ops. Um, speaking of air, the Osprey, still very concerned about the delays and getting them back up online. Um, obviously, we've seen what's happened in AFRICOM with the waving, uh, you know, and I still think it's a safe aircraft, incredible uh, safety profile considering its new technologies. Uh, but where are we at in, in getting them back to work at full process, getting our pilots up to speed uh, so they can be proficient at what they do best? Congressman, the MV-22, as you note, is, uh, it's our workhorse. Uh, we're always um, looking to modernize this asset. But we've been flying it in combat and in training since 2007. It's got a safety record consistent with all other platforms. Um, and it's a return to flight uh, has met the standard by Nav Air. So we are returning it to flight. We're going through day check rides, night check rides, and getting it back in the fight. Gotcha. With that, I have five seconds to say Semper Fi. Welcome back to the fight. Hoorah. Hoorah, sir. Mm. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Laloda. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, good to be with you today, sir. Um, our Navy Marine Corps team is the most lethal fighting force for good, for good the world has ever known. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, when he was Secretary of Defense, General Mattis would say that the policy decisions made at the Pentagon made here should be made in contemplation of ensuring that we have the most lethal fighting force the world has ever known. In general, would you agree with that? I'm sorry, in general, Mr. Secretary. Oh, I'm sorry. Right? I thought you were referring to the general, not in I should general. Watch my wording. <laughs> uh, absolutely, sir. Um, and of all the things that make our Navy Marine Corps team uh, the most lethal fighting force, we've talked about a few things today SM236, shipbuilding, um, some other equipment, amphibs, and whatnot. Uh, but our people, uh, do our people still remain the biggest component to our success? Without our, question, Congressman. Um, and I'm frustrated uh, because my questions aren't going to be about some of the infrastructure, some of the decisions about where our bases are and some of the technology we're acquiring, which are uh, rightful endeavors to us for us to discuss. Um, Admiral, do you remember meeting on the floor of the House two months ago or so during the State of the Union? Do you remember our conversation, Admiral? Uh, I'll remind you. Um, it was about status of forces agreements. Um, do you remember who my guest was at the State of the Union? Yes, I think it was the Mrs. Alconis. Lieutenant Ridge Alconis and his uh, spouse, yep. mm -hmm. uh, Brittany Alconis. Um, and I'm hoping that with the 100 years of collective naval service that the three of you have, combat deployments, command at sea, command at sea even for you, Mr. Secretary, that you can help uh, with this issue because I think it does strongly relate to lethality. Um, 25 years ago when I was a midshipman, the top of our class at the Naval Academy, of which I was not a part, uh, would select ships in the Seventh Fleet for the most part because that was the most challenging tip of the spear uh, assignments. And, and our best and brightest and from ROTC and OCS uh, would, would pick the same because of the challenge of those assignments and the specter that um, if we as a Navy Marine Corps team were in the biggest part of the fight, it would likely be in that part of the world. Uh, and that was in the year 2000. Now, 24 years later, it's much more apparent that uh, if our Navy Marine Corps team gets called into the biggest fight, it's likely to be in that part of the world. And because of the weaknesses of our status of forces agreement, specifically with Japan, less folks are seeking orders to Japan because they're inferior, our status of forces agreements. Um, in the case of Lieutenant Rigel Konis, real briefly, while traveling down Mount Fuji with his family, he innocently, because of mountain altitude sickness, lost control of his vehicle, no drinking or drugs involved, lost control of his vehicle, tragically resulted in the death of two Japanese nationals. The Japanese took custody of the lieutenant, denied him a right to a translator, denied him uh, any sort of attorney, sleep deprived him, and ultimately coerced him into a confession that resulted in him serving 507 days in a Japanese prison. That outcome would not have happened likely in Korea or any police else where we have status of forces agreements. Um, so my question is this. 
Mr. Secretary, I realize this is not under your jurisdiction. I realize that status of force agreements are generally negotiated between the Department of State and that friendly foreign nation. But Mr. Secretary, you are in the business uh, of ensuring that we have the most lethal fighting force the world has ever known. And the specter of conflict in that part of the world is more real than it's ever been. Uh, Mr. Secretary, can you commit to working with the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the State, and others to ensure that our status of forces agreements in nations like Japan comport with our values, contemplate lethality to ensure that if our men and women are called into fight in that battle, that they can have the confidence knowing that if they're out in town on liberty and find themselves accused of a crime by a friendly foreign nation, that they have rights similar to what rights the everyday American citizen have would have in America. Absolutely, Congressman. The safety of our personnel um, in the United States and serving overseas is incredibly important to us, and those SOFA agreements are also incredibly important to protect their rights. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And can you commit to following up in due course, three or six months, to tell me what progress we've made as a Navy Marine Corps team to ensure that our sailors and Marines in the Seventh Fleet in Japan have better protections, Mr. Secretary? Absolutely, Congressman. Thank you. And with the remainder of my time, on behalf of Mr. Waltz, uh, with, the, with the unanimous consent, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record his letter uh, to you, Mr. Secretary, regarding his request that uh, those service members at Abbey Gate be posthumously uh, promoted. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I yield, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields. Chair not recognized. Gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary Del Toro, the last time I saw you, we were under the ice up in the Arctic Ocean, uh, Ice X. Uh, we were on an attack sub, and that was a, quite an experience. Yes, sir. There's some amazing capability that we've, we fielded out there. Uh, Admiral French, I'll ask my first question to you. Over the past several years, Congress has appropriated over $3 billion for the development of the conventional prompt strike CPS hypersonic missile. Yet to date, that program has yet to successfully test an all-up round. I understand these testing problems are driving a program replan that aims to field the hypersonic capability on USS Zumwalt by the end of 2025 and the Virginia class SSN five years later in 2030. Given the recently reported shipbuilding delays, are these platforms on track to accommodate hypersonic capability on this timeline? Well, thank you for the question. And you know, first, let me say how important the CPS capability is. You know, it's extremely lethal, maneuverable, and it's something that we need to have going forward. And we're in development of that program uh, along with the Army. And so we're committed to developing that, getting that out as quickly as possible, and making sure that we are doing all the proper testing to move that forward. Um, as far as our platforms go, the Zumwalt uh, entered the shipyard. Uh, down in Pascagoula now, and uh, you know she. I went down to visit her just uh, about a, maybe a month ago, and uh, sh they are moving fast to get her ready for the CPS alt. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting her out. And so when she's done, that that would be uh, coincident with the missile uh, being ready. Uh, the Virginia payload. We've certainly seen uh, some of the delays in our submarines, and uh, you know, right now we want to invest in the submarine industrial base so we can increase the cadence and really set the conditions to meet the cadence and delivery that we really need going forward. And that will be part of that capability. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, I understand that some critical flight tests for CPS are scheduled for later this year, and I'm hopeful that they'll be successful. But I think we're not moving fast enough. Can you please tell us specifically what we can do to increase the tempo or cadence of, of the testing? Well, I think, you know, continuing to work with our testing community, with Admiral Wolf, with everyone who's involved with this and uh, the Army, you know, they are moving with a sense of urgency, and they feel that every single day. Uh, Secretary Del Toro, since the October 7th attack on Israel, we've seen a steadily deteriorating security environment in the Middle East. One of the hallmarks of that environment is the attacks by Iranian-backed militias, specifically using cheap attack, attack drones. I applaud the U.S. Navy's performance in defending against this threat, but it comes at a significant and unsustainable cost long term. You testified to the Senate Appropriations Committee that the service required about a billion dollars to replenish stocks of air defense missiles. And uh, General Carilla told this committee that he encourages the Navy to deploy directed energy, specifically shipborne lasers such as the Helio system, to get on the right side of the cost 
per shot equation. So, Secretary, um, Under Secretary Hsu recently said the department is working on a directed energy system for the Navy with three times the power of existing systems. Can you update us on what the Navy is doing to develop shipboard directed energy capability? Thank you, Congressman. You're absolutely right that we need to make even greater investments in the future. We should have been making them for a long, long time. But nevertheless, um, we are continuing to make investments in order to get Helios deployable. She will hopefully be deployable here sometime in, in the next several months, but certainly by the end of the year, hopefully, um, on USS Preble. Uh, but we have six other programs, including some of the one that Heidi Hsu is talking about as, as well, to make added investments in high, more high-power lasers, as well as other directed energy programs, many of which are also SAP programs that we can't talk about openly. And uh, General Smith, um, I know that part of the Force Design 2030 has been to rethink the capabilities of the Marine Corps and the needs in the Indo-PACOM theater. Can you talk about the importance of systems like the medium range intercept capability, which is a directed energy um, uh, capability, and what we're doing to speed up its delivery to the Marines? Well, sir, I can. Um, the MRIC medium range intercept capability is one of the backbones of our strategy. Uh, it paired with a TPS-80 Gator radar can sense uh, targets uh, very small uh, diameter targets at great range and can intercept them uh, at again at great range and at a different classification level I can discuss the range with you but it is a, a critical part of our force design throughout the first island chain to disrupt a potential PRC attack. Okay. Thank you all and I yield back. I thank the gentleman and I thank the witnesses uh, this testimony has been very helpful and uh, we look forward to taking uh, what you shared with us today and folding it into the National Defense Authorization Act uh, later this month. And with that, I will yield to the ranking member for any closing comments he may have. I am good, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good. We're done. Thank you.